All right, if everybody could uh, wander toward their seats. Ooh. Okay, um, good morning everyone. I'm uh, Matt Ron. I'm the Mayor Pro Tem for uh, beautiful city of Temecula. Thank you all for joining us here uh, this morning. Um, I am uh, uh, very honored to be able to introduce our uh, distinguished uh, group of, of speakers, panelists, and, and experts today. Uh, first of which is uh, Mr. Terry McHale with uh, Aaron Reed and Associates. Um, you know, Terry brings with, uh, with him uh, years of uh, experience in uh, uh, Sacramento and legislation and uh, advocacy um, and has worked very hard to uh, uh, represent a variety of perspectives from law enforcement, uh, fire, uh, and others. Um, I appreciate all of our, our speakers joining us today. I know it's a bit of a trek to come all the way down here for us, but uh, this is an issue that's very important to a lot of our cities. I uh, like to welcome all of our, our cities and, and guests as well. Uh, thank you for joining us. I know this is an important conversation that we're, uh, we're going to have today. Um, and uh, wanted to uh, delay no further and bring Mr. Uh, McHale up here to uh, kick this event off. Thank you so much for uh, joining us on behalf of the city of Temecula. Terry. Thanks. That's nice. You're always guaranteed an applause when you're the first one. <laughs> Thank you very much uh, for being here today. When we were asked to come here, the, uh, the message that we were asked to deliver was not to advocate or proselytize for the advancement of marijuana into any community, but rather just to give sort of the bold facts of how is it that California reached where we are today. So I'm gonna do just a, a very brief history of how California got here. In 1996, this is 29 years after the Summer of Love, this is more than 25 years after Life magazine ran pictures of young people smoking marijuana on our college campuses and at, con at concerts, the people of California passed Proposition 215. This created limited immunity for qualified patients. It was medicinal marijuana only. And it created limited immunity for qualified patients who use or cultivate marijuana for medical purposes when such use has been recommended by a California doctor for serious medical conditions. And I would guess this most parents in 1996 were shocked to realize the epidemic among college kids who suddenly had insomnia and upset stomachs and needed a medical card to get marijuana in order to sleep, to eat, to survive. It provided limited immunity that also covered primary caregivers, but it did not address local zoning laws or retail, sale, uh, retail sales. Interestingly, Prop 215 was not the first initiative to be put before the people of California. That initiative was in 1972. In 1972, at a time when everybody wore plaid and white belts and white shoes, and Richard Nixon was elected by the largest margin in American history, the people of California put on a ballot, a ballot measure that would decriminalize marijuana. Nobody expected it to pass. The shock, however, was that 35% of the people of California voted for that initiative. And so it changed the way the legislature decided to deal with it. And what the legislature did between 19, 1972 and 1975 was to do everything possible to decriminalize marijuana. So what does that mean? Well, in 1913, the people of California wrote the first anti-marijuana law, first law dealing with marijuana, and placed it in the Poison Act and made it a crime to possess or sell any kind of marijuana unless it was prescribed by a doctor. And the penalties were fiscal, you were fined. But between 1913 and 1962, the penalties for marijuana became increasingly more onerous. Looking around the people in this room, if most of you had been popped for a joint in 1968, several things would have happened. One, mandatory one year in, in jail. One to two years is the, is the penalty. It's a felony. The felony does not get erased, and you're, you're given a fine. 
If you're popped a second time, it's two to 20 years. So it was no laughing matter in these glory days of the 1960s to get caught with marijuana. Between 1972 and 1975, the legislature decided to address it. And what they did was they struggled with how much marijuana could a person have on their person and not be arrested. An AB 95 almost passed that was going to allow three ounces. If you got caught with three ounces of marijuana, it would be considered personal use. You would not be arrested. You would not be jailed. There would be no rec criminal record on your part. And the fine would be $100. Now, the legislature couldn't agree on three ounces, but they did agree on one ounce. To, to revisit uh, SB 420, the legislature's first attempt to regulate, it took effect in 2004, created a voluntary state ID card program run by county health departments to help identify qualified patients. It extended limited immunity to include transportation, collective or cooperative cultivation projects. It established a six plant personal cultivation threshold and it was codified. Between 1996, the passage of 245, and 2012, one other piece of legislation was passed. That was, uh, I'm sorry, that was SB 420 by Vasconcelos, which made it easier to, to move uh, medical marijuana through the state. Uh, in, 196, in, in 2016, the legislature acted dynamically. And what prompted it? What happened was, is that they started polling and realizing that nobody was being arrested and charged for marijuana, that other states were now allowing complete and total uh, legalization of marijuana. And so they put Proposition 64 on the ballot. Proposition 64 allows the complete uh, use of marijuana. It passed in the state of California, 56 to 44%. And in this particular area, it passed with 51%. The legislature responded by creating the Medical Marijuana Regulation and Safety Act, which was a package of three bills. Uh, 22 bills had been introduced. These were the three that set up the Marijuana Regulation and Safety Act. Assembly Bill 243, Assembly Bill 266, and Assembly Bill 643. What is interesting is that the legislators who wrote these bills are very moderate, they're very respected, they're very reliable, and the legislation itself moved rather easily through the legislature and was signed by Governor Brown in 2015. Their provisions take place on January 1st, 2016, and in them going into effect, essentially, it tells the Department of Consumer Affairs that they need to set up uh, regulations by January of 2018. The key concepts of this legislation, and this is probably the key of what we're talking about here today. The key concept of what's happening in the state of California is that it's a dual licensing process by state and local uh, licensing authorities. The state of California cannot unilaterally go to any district, to any community, and say that they absolutely have to allow cultivation, distribution, testing, and transportation of cannabis. That decision begins at the local level. And that is probably the most sacrosanct part of all of the legislation that has been written is the idea that you have to respect local control. Criminal and civil penalties for unlicensed activities were enhanced. The idea that we're going to legalize cannabis and for those who do it illegally will be, pushed, will be uh, punished more onerously. The new Bureau of Medical Marijuana Regulation will be created within the Department of Consumer Affairs. So they're calling the uh, director of, of, of this sort of the, the marijuana czar although this is one of those unique situations where the czar is not actually the czar, she has her boss, which is the director of the Department of Consumer Affairs, and he will be up here next to explain where the Department of Consumer Affairs and where the medical marijuana regulation 
uh, Bureau is going. Uh, the legislation also became, I, it's the idea of the legislation and the uh, 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 initiative is that it allowed several agencies, including the Department of Justice, Food and Ag, and the State Water Board, to have new and expanded enforcement rules. The question becomes, for any community, and certainly for any, any policymakers uh, who are in the room, is what do you do at a local level to deal with marijuana? And I think probably the most succinct answers that have come is that while you can make the decisions on a personal level, you cannot build the wall to keep marijuana itself away or out of your, uh, the reach of family, friends, and uh, visitors to the community. I would say for those communities that decide that they want to participate, they would probably tell other communities that are on the fence not to do it because they don't want the competition. They want to be able to control it. You know, the fewer people who participate, the greater the tax reward is to those who do participate. Is marijuana going, you know, uh, in 1970, they did a poll, and they asked the people of California what they thought about total legalization for marijuana. And only 3% of the people in 1970 believed in total legalization. 10% believed that there should be some kind of controls in which you tied it to alcohol. In those 47 years since that poll was taken, the most recent poll says that half, more than half of the people who live in the United States of America have smoked marijuana. Most of it, most people believe it's either be a benign influence on their lives or a helpful influence on their lives. 33 million people say that they smoke marijuana on a regular basis. So the reality is it's here, it's not going to go away, and we need to decide how best to regulate it, how best to tax it, and how best to keep it safe for those who are going to use it. And so we put together, I think, a group of folks today that will really go a long way toward answering some of these questions for you. Uh, if you have particular questions uh, of the speakers that are up here, please write them down and give them to Randy over here. And Randy will make sure that the questions get asked and that the questions get answered. Without any further to do, it's my pleasure to introduce someone who I've known for a long time. He was a distinguished chief of staff in the legislature. Uh, he is someone with sort of a, a vast knowledge of not only uh, marijuana itself, uh, cannabis, uh, but also how it is that legislation and regulation impacts the uh, personal lives of Californians. And we really appreciate that he flew down last night and is flying out this afternoon. Uh, my honor to, to present the director of the Department of Consumer Affairs, Dean Grafilo. I'm gonna, I know I'm gonna mess this up. How do I shrink it back down? I'm setting up, he's Dean, I'm setting up a slide. All right, guys, how do I just shrink it back down? I'll let you do it. How do you know? <laughs> you do well, I don't know. Good job. The, uh, okay, this shrinks the down. So, uh, and go here. F5. There we go. And here's your. Good morning, city of Temecula. How's everyone doing this morning? Terry, thank you so much for that kind introduction. I'll also add that um, as the director for the Department of Consumer Affairs, while cannabis is an issue that could arguably occupy every hour of the day, every minute of the day for me, there are 30, 38 other programs that the Department of Consumer Affairs um, handles. 
um, and I'll get to some of those programs in addition to cannabis, but I also wanted to mention that prior to coming to the department, as Terry mentioned, I was chief of staff most recently for current assembly member Rob Bonta. You may have saw his name on one of the slides that uh, Terry showed. He's one of the key authors for the medicinal cannabis bill that went through the legislature in 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 16, pardon me, in 15. And prior to that, I was a governmental advocate for the California Medical Association. I was there for three years. Prior to that, I was chief of staff for a former assembly member, Warren Furatani. He represents uh, the city's southern Los Angeles, Gardena, North Long Beach. And then prior to that, I was a senior leg staffer for former majority leader, Alberto Tarico. He's out of the East Bay cities of Fremont, Newark, and Union City. And then I first cut my teeth uh, after college as an organizer uh, with a labor union in the state of Hawaii. And one of its mantras of the ILWU Local 142 is we take care of you from the womb to the tomb. Because we literally had NICU nurses to grave diggers. Jump to 2017 when I came on board to the Department of Consumer Affairs and its 39 entities. Similarly, the Department of Consumer Affairs takes care of you from the womb to the tomb as well. Because we literally have physicians, NICU nurses, to, and we regulate funeral homes and cemeteries as well. And so um, that, 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 that experience, that past, um, um, has hopefully girded me for the very, very interesting issues specific to the Department of Consumer Affairs. And naturally, I'm here today to discuss some of the issues specific to, to cannabis. My discussion today is gonna be pretty straightforward. I'm gonna try to make sure that uh, clearly explain the structure of the Bureau of Cannabis Control and where that resides under the department. Share the explicit goals of the Bureau of Cannabis Control. In the slides that, are f that follow, it'll, you'll see it just as, it'll read as BCC. Share the timelines and regulations for the licensing and also the process of the regulation process, uh, of the process of the regulations for cannabis, and naturally, the relationship to, to local governments. Terry provided a great synopsis of the history of cannabis in this state. I'm not going to uh, expand much more than that, other than to say that um, it's important for folks to also note that in 2015, the Medical Marijuana Regulation Safety Act preceded Prop 64 in AUMA. Um, a lot of folks felt that, um, you know, prior to MC, MM, MMRSA getting passed in the legislature, that would hopefully that would serve as a blueprint for a lot that we saw in Prop 64 in, in 2016. And then, as Terry mentioned, the most recent iteration in terms of policy at the statewide level is the combination of what happened um, with MMRSA and AUMA into the 27, 2017, uh, it was actually a budget bill, um, we're affectionately known as MACURSA. So you'll see, and you'll hear me mention MACURSA um, throughout this presentation. And medicinal is uh, what I'm gonna be referring to, obviously, the uh, MMSR, MMRSA legislation that passed through. Again, just to emphasize, the landscape currently in terms of policy is obviously where we're at, 2017, post Prop 64, post uh, uh, the most recent Budget Act. But again, the most recent Budget, budget Act of MACURSA is what combined the medicinal bill in 2015 and then 2016's AUMA, AUMA Prop 64. Some background about the Bureau of Cannabis Control. So it was established in 20, 2015 through MMRSA. As mentioned, it's the lead agency bureau in the development of state in the, of the state for the regulatory structure of commercial cannabis. Laurie Ajax is the 
bureau chief, and she was uh, appointed in February of 16 uh, by Governor Brown. And again, throughout today's discussion, you will hear many, many times over the dual licensing, dual licensing model that uh, maintains local control. Um, even when I was staff for Bonta during the uh, MCRSA, can't emphasize enough how often local control was paramount in, in, in that legislation, and that has obviously prevailed uh, through today. This slide attempts to describe the different licensing responsibilities of the three different uh, departments, agencies, that are responsible for the licensing and eventually enforcement of cannabis. BCC, the Bureau of Cannabis Control, will be licensing the distributors, micro businesses, retailers, testing laboratories. The California Department of Food and Ag will be licensing cultivators, and they're going to be responsible for the very, very important track and trace piece of all of this that's going to allow um, yeah, the regulators to ensure that the product is literally traced from this notion of seed to sale. Um, naturally, we want to ensure that there isn't any kind of diversion that's happening, um, either leaving the state, et cetera. So track and trace is, again, responsibility of the California Department of Food and Egg. And then the California Department of Public Health, they will be licensing and enforcing the, manufa the manufacturers. And they're also responsible for a public outreach campaign. It is referred to as Let's Talk Cannabis. They actually launched it um, informally about a month and a half ago. And I think it, um, as we get closer to the January 1 deadline, you'll see more of, of, of that campaign, public outreach campaign happening. This slide, hopefully you can see some of the detail there, but I'll mention it as well. Here's the structure of the, the Bureau of Cannabis Control. Obviously up top is the office of the, the governor. The agency that houses um, the de Department of Consumer Affairs and the Bureau is the Business Consumer Services and Housing Agency. There are actually eight other departments that are under BCSH. Department of Consumer Affairs is one of those nine, as I just mentioned. And then Lori Ajax, again, she's the chief of the Bureau of Cannabis Control. And naturally, the Bureau has executive staff and others. The goal is to ramp up, on, the, on specific to the Bureau staff, slowly ramping up its staff for the January 1 deadline, naturally with the um, amount of licensees uh, applications that we're anticipating. We are um, ramping up the staffing levels for the license, the, the licensing analysts for that area. But then as we get closer into mid-18, a lot of the um, enforcement staff and others will round out, which will initially, initially be a bureau of probably about 150 to 180, I believe, employees. And then remains to be seen if there's going to be a need for continued growth uh, for that bureau. Again, it's kind of moving targets in terms of the amount of, of uh, total licensees specific to the Bureau of Cannabis Control, as well as the other agencies. I know there's projective numbers specific to the departments, which is uh, about 22,000 uh, specific to the distributors, transporters, et cetera. Um, but again, I guess we will actually hope we will get a better sense of that when the time comes. Here are the main goals of the Bureau, pretty straightforward. Straightforward. Im implement the state regulatory structure for commercial cannabis to encourage participation in the regulated legal market. Meet statutory deadline of January 1 of 18. And collaboratively work with all stakeholders to create and maintain the regulatory framework. I can't emphasize enough that third point in order for cannabis, pardon me, in order for California to do cannabis, quote unquote, right, it really, really requires that collaborative work of all stakeholders. And um, as I get to some of the other slides that has been 
there's been a lot of activity by the Bureau, by the department, by the other departments as well, trying to ensure that collaborative um, endeavor is in fact achieved. Again, some of the, B, the, the Bureau activities that I was just mentioning. The main goal of these sessions was to gain insight into the industry, to know what the major issues and concerns were across all stakeholder, stakeholders. And it was the, the beginning of establishing relationships with the public and stakeholders to get involved in the process. As you folks may very well know, just given the history of this issue, for many there's the hesitancy to kind of quote unquote come you know, out of the shadows and into the light for into a fully regulated market. And um, we believe that the only way to encourage that is to build that trust and rapport and that quite frankly starts with having open and honest conversations much like we're doing here, well, we tried to do that uh, with stakeholders all across the state. Just continuing with the activities of the Bureau. So th these were specific to the MCRSA, so the, the, medi the medicinal, um, um, yeah, the, the, the medicinal bill. And these workshops were val very valuable in getting the public involved and to make sure the draft regulations were better informed so that the public had a glimpse of the direction the Bureau was going. We provided draft regulation concepts and asked for feedback, allowed stakeholders, the industry, and the public to really be part of the process. I was able to inv be involved in some of those, and I was really surprised and impressed with uh, the amount of attendance uh, that, in fact, happened at these um, workshops. And um, it was a good kind of peek into what would happen in some of the other licensing workshops, other reg workshop, pre-regulatory workshops that we did um, following this, and I'll, I'll, I'll get to those slides as well. So the, the Bureau's activities specific to dra draft regulations. You know, there's a quick overview of the draft regulations for medical cannabis were issued for general licensing, transporters, dispensaries, distributors, and testing laboratories. Again, these proposed regs were first issued of, in April and May of, of, of this year, and in effort to try to get the word out about these proposed medicinal regs, we had uh, comment hearings uh, across the state. Um, noted here, San Jose, Sacramento, Los Angeles, Eureka. Ideally, we'd been, we would have been able to get to uh, uh, many other cities and localities as well. Um, but we, a lot of folks were also able to provide feedback uh, electronically, which was incredibly helpful as um, you know, the drafting of the proposed regs continued. As part of the process, there was a CEQA initial study that happened in September. Again, meetings were held specific to those in Long Beach, Fresno, and Sacramento. And then these meetings explained the CEQA process and, and public comment. I'm sure you folks at the local government level are very familiar with uh, the CEQA, CEQA process. In terms of outreach, the Bureau, the Department, others, tried to get to as many different conferences, seminars, workshops as possible. Again, the only real way to get the word out is you know, earning, uh, earning the time to um, get, get the word out. And we, again, we tried to make sure to collaborate with all the key stakeholders, try to make sure that we were outreaching to you know, the vast uh, different me media markets and the, the vast uh, communities. Um, I'll be the first to recognize that it is uphill battle in terms of mass communication to you know, all corners of California, and so that's why we're so very reliant on uh, localities as well to help uh, get you know, the information and, and the facts out specific uh, to cannabis. So what's next in the process? And I'm kind of going backwards because, again, this was specific to the medicinal cannabis proposed regs. So the official notice of decision not to proceed in, in practice withdrew our medical regs. And through all the, although the, we were all get, we were, through all the comments we received will be incredibly valuable to our work specific to MACURSA. And those will be 
coming out um, momentarily, uh, probably uh, this month um, is, 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 is the plan. And so the Mercursa regs are, will be noticed likely, like I just said, this month, there's gonna be, this is part of the, of the emergency regulation process. There's gonna be a five day public comment period to follow. Um, and then from that date posted, the Office of Administrative, Administrative Law, there will be a 10, 10 day calendar review period. The first five days will be public comment, um, maybe in the, which will be submitted to OAO on the Bureau. And then the Bureau can choose to respond to those comments, but it has to be done by the eighth day of the 10 day process. This is just one of the windows in which the, the public will be able to um, you know, provide comment. Um, after the start of, of, of the new year, there'll be the regular rulemaking process where there's um, a, much, a much larger window for, for comments. Pardon me, let's see here. So what's next for the emergency regs? There's a lot of details specific to each of these hash, hashtags. I'm not gonna go to each and every one of them, but some of the things I think it's important to share are specific to ownership. Again, these are specific to medicinal. They, are, they may change in Mercursa. I can't emphasize enough that they may, but um, um, this is gonna provide a good insight in terms of probably the direction that, we're, that the regs will eventually go specific to issues such as ownership, where the person is an owner if, own, if any of the following apply, holds at least 20% aggregate ownership, person is a chief executive office of a nonprofit or other entity applying, the person is a member of a board of directors of a nonprofit, the person is an individual who will be participating in the direction, control, or management of the business, and owners must submit fingerprints and information regarding any criminal convictions. Specific to convictions, the proposed medical regs, again, they may, they may change in the new regs, but any application may be denied if the applicant has been convicted of an, off, of an offense that is substantially related to the qualifications, functions, or duties of the business for which the application is made. The bureau staff will be vetting all the applications naturally specific uh, to that substantially related. And there's gonna be security requirements, priority licensing issues, a number of others. But again, this is part of the process of the emergency reg, reg, emergency reg process, which also mirrored what happened with the medicinal. Specific to distributors, all cannabis goods mass, must pass through a distributor prior to being sold to a retailer. Distributors may arrange for lab testing and quality assurance for all cannabis products, except for immature plants and seeds received from a licensed nursery. Distributors may purchase the cannabis goods or provide their services without taking ownership of the cannabis products. And distributors may package and label cannabis in the form of dried, dried flour. It's continuing on specific to transportation licensing. Again, the proposed regs spell out the type of vehicle, vehicle requirements, what's on the manifest. Um, again, I can't emphasize enough that these may change specific to what happens in, in the emergency reg, reg process. Similarly, specific to retailers and dispensers, dispensaries. Again, you're getting the common theme here where with these regs, we're spelling out the specifics. Um, a lot of folks can, again, refer to what was churned out in the uh, proposed medicinal regs, should provide some insight for what's gonna happen eventually via the emergency reg process. But ultimately, um, wanted to share, again, the breadth of all the different issues that the, the reg process is going to address. Testing labs, another key piece specific to the Bureau. The testing labs are gonna cover provisional test, the provisional testing, testing of lab licensees, the sampling, the test perform, and then the certificate of analysis. 
So in terms of the licensing, we have had, I mentioned earlier, some licensing workshops across the state um, recently. I've been really impressed with the amount of attendees that uh, went to these licensing workshops in Los Angeles, uh, Riverside, Fresno, and um, Sacramento. Literally hundreds of folks uh, attended these, um, exceeded capacity, so much interest in wanting to get information um, for, this, for this new industry that's about to be regulated. Also, what's next? Or we're going to be having our first advisory committee meeting. Um, it's going to be happening next Thursday, the 16th. As you folks may very well know, one of the committee members is uh, Temecula's own, Dr. Matt Ron. Um, he's going to be able to, uh, you folks are all familiar with the insight that he brings, and he really exemplifies the kind of individual that we were trying to make sure was on the committee because of the diversity of issues. Uh, specific to cannabis, it's so important that uh, we have that local government insight as well as his uh, breadth of, of, of knowledge even beyond local government. So, pretty self-explanatory in terms of the Bureau and local government. Terry emphasized it, I'll emphasize it again, it's all about local control. Um, pursuant to business code, 26055, an applicant can, this is specific to the last uh, bullet, an applicant can but is not required to provide proof of local authorization. Either way, the Bureau has to contact each local jurisdiction to make sure the applicant is allowed to operate there. Each city and county will have 60 days to respond to the Bureau, after which the Bureau can assume the person is in good standing locally and issue a license. Again, uh, we're not going to provide that state license until we are sure that uh, the local has um, authorized. And with that, I'll leave you my email. Um, apologize that I won't be able to be here for the entire um, uh, program today. I know there's going to be some Q&A after the next presenter. Um, happy to uh, uh, address questions. But going forward, know that the department and the bureau are always going to make ourselves available to um, answer questions that many, many folks have as, again, as we start to regulate this new industry. Thank you. So our next speaker is uh, Mike Madrid. Mike has many years of experience with local government. He, when I met him 20 plus years ago, he was working and doing a lot of outreach and PR on behalf of the League of California Cities. Um, still, I believe, may contract with them, but since then has started a consulting business that we all go to probably on a weekly basis just to find out what is happening in California cities. He's the expert there. I'll let him expand on his business. In the meantime, I'm going to attempt to pull up his. <laughs> I apologize. I am very challenged when it comes to the. Boom. Look at you. I'm just uh, forward. I'm back. Yep. Thank you, everybody. Good morning. Uh, it's good to see some friends that I've worked with in local government over the course of the past decade or so. Uh, to those of you who have not met me, my firm is, um, is the screen up? Will it be up? The firm is um, Grassroots Lab, which has become an unfortunate name and designation over the course of the past couple of years. Uh, we, we established ourselves about 10 years ago um, and uh, as, as Randy just mentioned, my work has been with the League of California Cities. My partner, Rob Karinke in Southern California was the executive director of the League of LA Cities. And I bring those up because our, our, our whole mission of our firm is to advocate on behalf of local government and local control. And I, I do want to talk a little bit about my firm uh, for the only, only to give you a higher sense of where we are coming from. Most of our client base tends to be local governments, local elected officials especially as it relates to helping develop policies 
for the first eight years of our existence, it was primarily on things like utility users taxes, sales taxes, um, land use decisions, trying to advise um, elected officials, city managers, department heads on issues facing the community. The issue of cannabis and or marijuana, I still call it marijuana, I think that's not in vogue anymore, I think the term is cannabis. You started to come to us, it was something that we very much shied away from because of our client base. Uh, so that you know we don't represent anybody from uh, the uh, industry. We don't have any, any, make any judgment pro or con, but our, our uh, motivation is on protecting local governments and making sure that the interest of the local government is placed first and foremost in the minds of decision makers when you're considering with these policies. And so what I want to talk about a little bit today is how you, de how, how you come to that decision making process and what is right for your community. Um, if you are left with the impression that this is coming, so get with it and you know, get out of uh, the mud and kind of keep moving forward, um, you should not feel that way, okay? Um, while it is, this industry is coming and it is barreling and it is changing, it is important to understand that even in Colorado, right, the gold standard for cannabis regulation, 70% of counties do not permit the cultivation or sale of cannabis. 70% of counties in Colorado do not permit the sale or cultivation of cannabis, right? It's largely, not exclusively, but it's largely kind of a large urban phenomenon in most of those cities and counties. And most people don't understand this. And it's important to understand because Colorado was successful in reaching its passage of threshold a few years ago by focusing uh, very much on the concept of local control. And I also want to be very direct and candid in saying in some of the early drafts of Proposition 64, those local control provisions were not in there. A lot of us fought strenuously to make sure that they were in there because ultimately this decision, like most decisions, and I guess I'm biased that way, is that local communities are best suited to decide what works for them, okay? Including a complete and outright ban, okay? Even if your community voted for or supported it, uh, and there are not many in California, only 18 of 58 California counties voted against Proposition 64. A lot of the communities in this region of the state uh, we're basically evenly split. I think the city was 51% for, 49 opposed. I think uh, Wildemar was talking something from Wildemar was 52 support. I mean, anything that's 50-50, take, take a land use decision, for example. Highly emotional, highly divisive issue. Anything that splits 50-50 is something that the local government has an obligation, regardless of where it's going to be, to engage the community in that discussion and in that dialogue. And that's what I want to talk about today. Because if you were like me, and again, I've been doing, working with cities for 25 years. I have seen in the last two years more local government consultants pop up that I've never seen before who are experts in this field, advising people in communities on what to do with their jurisdictions. And the, the lead argument tends to be, well, your community voted for this, and so you need to be for this as well. Nine times out of 10, that is the case, but it is not always the case. And I'll give you a specific example uh, we advised when we're working with the city of Riverside on a local measure. We went in, we polled, and I'm going to talk about polling in just a second, and found very clearly the residents of Riverside did not want cannabis in any way, shape, or form. They didn't want to tax it. They didn't want to regulate it. They didn't want to isolate it. They didn't want it. There's nothing wrong with that. And we advised the city to say, to, to pursue and continue its ban. Nothing wrong with that. But in most cities, um, there is usually some variation Okay? There's usually some gradation of what the community wants, and as decision makers, and as law enforcement, and as people engage with the communities, there's an obligation, I think, to kind of at least have the discussion and to try to quantify what it is that your community is looking for, because otherwise you end up running into longer-term problems. And that's what I do for a living, is try to prevent these problems from happening at the local level. So again, 64 empowered individual counties and municipalities to restrict the location of cannabis businesses or to outright ban the sale of marijuana from their jurisdictions, right? Moreover, local jurisdictions were allowed by the measure to, quote, reasonably regulate the personal growth, possession, and use of marijuana plants allowed by Proposition 64. Congratulations, local decision makers. It is your job to reasonably regulate. And what does that mean on this industry that has really never existed before? You as local decision makers have a tremendous amount of authority to decide and determine what works and most importantly, what doesn't work for your community. Uh, the two excise taxes, I know there's gonna be a lot of questions on taxation. I'm not skilled at talking about uh, you know, black markets and how much revenue estimates might look like. There are people that are going to be speaking after me that are far better equipped to do that, and they'll be sharing their thoughts on that. But this is what the law allows. 
And again, some of those counties that voted against the measure have implemented the most restrictive policies so far. Many of you know the League of California Cities was advising a lot of cities to put bans in place as your cities were determining what was working best for the local jurisdiction. I think that was sound advice. It was good advice. But if you are like most cities, you're attending workshops like this, you're reaching out to experts in the field, people who helped write the legislation or who help cities and guide them through the process to ascertain whether or not that ban is something that should be continued or whether it's something that should be modified or what worked for the best interests of your city. Okay? So the, the basic arguments, as I've seen them from talking to local government leaders every day about this topic, are really three of why people should proactively, and then there is at least one, and again, I'm not saying these are the only ones, I'm not putting any merit or value or judgment on these, I'm trying to use this as a basis for discussion on what you should be considering. The first is money, and let's be candid. What we have found, and I'm gonna show you some websites where we track some of this stuff, because our firm does track and monitor all the ordinances in the state as they develop, I think it's one of the great ironies, or maybe not, maybe I'm just a little bit old-fashioned, old school, that in some of the most conservative parts of the state, you're seeing this industry burgeon faster than in others. And the reason really comes down to finances. It's money, okay? Regardless of what um, people feel about the issue as a cultural issue or as a, as, a, as a social issue, there's a tremendous amount of, potentially a tremendous amount of revenue at stake. Most estimates, as I think as the previous speaker said, is this is going to be larger than the alcohol industry probably in the next three, four, five years. It's a tremendous amount of revenue, okay? And so that revenue is a consideration. I'm not saying it should be the deciding issue, but it is a consideration, okay? The second is it prevents revenue leakage. And we haven't talked about this a lot as local governments, but we're going to be talking about a lot more. And it's something you're going to have to be mindful of. Okay, and like the fiscalization of land use or other concepts or terms that you guys are very familiar with as local decision makers, if you don't get that auto mall, the city next to you might get that auto mall, right? And if you decide that a ban works for you or doesn't work for you, the surrounding jurisdictions are having these same conversations, okay? And I will uh, tell you with absolute 100% certainty, there is cannabis, marijuana being sold and distributed in your community right now. I know that's a shocker, I know that's breaking news, but it is happening in every community in California right now, okay? And that, that should not be an argument for why you should legalize, or, or it's already legal, but why you should permit it or authorize it, but it's certainly a consideration. Be foolish not to consider it, but I think it's important to put on the, the financial consideration, which is... Um, if it's being sold in your community and you're not seeing the revenue side of this, but you're still uh, required to provide the law enforcement capacity for it, while your sister city or neighboring communities are seeing a revenue benefit of it, as decision makers, as policymakers, that leakage argument is one you're going to have to make. It's one you're going to have to consider, and it's probably going to be one of the dominant points of discussion, I would suggest, over the next 18 months to two years as local governments consider whether or not to uh, allow or permit various stages of cultivation, sale, manufacturing, delivery, um, because if you're not getting that money, somebody around you probably is. Then this one eases the burden on local law enforcement. That's obviously arguable, and I'd leave that to the law enforcement's. Um, they could say it could be a bigger burden. I think that, again, there are policy, law enforcement policy experts that are much more equipped for me, uh, more, much better equipped than I am to make this, this argument. But again, in terms of enforcement, as I shared with you, there is marijuana being grown in your community. There is marijuana being delivered in your community. There is marijuana being sold in your community. The question of when to regulate and what to regulate and how to regulate um, is increasingly becoming one of those arguments. And the no is, will these policies actually affect change? If we do do this, are we encouraging the behavior? Are we you know, tacitly saying this is part of a society that we want to be? Those are all the community discussions that I think you need to have, and I think they're very important as you determine what you want for your community. Now, there's a couple of ways to do this, okay? And I want to spend a little bit of time on this point because it's very important. The first, and if any city, if you have not done this yet, I think you're making a very grave mistake. And if you're considering adopting or changing your, your ordinance uh, to permit or restrict, if you have not done a, a professional public opinion survey, you are doing yourself and your community an enormous, enormous, you're putting them at an enormous disadvantage, okay? This is, it's, it's, there is a science to public opinion survey work, 
And as decision makers, if you're not quantifying public opinion scientifically as a starting point for the discussion, you're doing your community a disservice. You just are, okay? And what you can glean from these surveys are extraordinary. Most of your cities already do customer satisfaction surveys, not all of them. Oftentimes those pollsters are um, very capable of, of asking some of these questions. Most of them are already doing these questions. If you're not, I'm more than happy to follow up with you and get you some names that you can go out to an RFP process on three or four different polling firms that are very skilled at this and have done many, many dozens to kind of help you begin as a beginning point to quantify the discussion that is happening already in your community. Which leads me to the second point. Once you have that survey work done, once it's quantified, once you've got math and science that you can actually say, this is how the residents of Riverside or Wildemar or Temecula, this is how they feel from a polling survey, beginning your community outreach to key stakeholders then becomes a second and necessary process to begin that dialogue and that discussion. Because there's going to be disagreement on this issue and it's something that you need to lean into and embrace rather than shy away from or kind of hide from, okay? And the reason I know that it works is some cities have done this remarkably well. It's a great story. I uh, obviously put up the entire article on what is happening, and this is the city of, of Sacramento. Uh, I'm going to sing the praises of this city for just a moment. One, because it doesn't, it doesn't get a lot of good press, being Sacramento and all, especially on the hinterland. Um, does anyone remember John Shirey, former city manager, if the city manager, there's probably do, former city manager of Sacramento. He was the head of the California Redevelopment Association when there was such a thing as redevelopment. Um, John Shirey was a former client of mine, worked with him for many years, became the city manager of Sacramento. We would have lunch regularly. And about three years ago, as this issue came up, I asked John, how much time do you spend on, on marijuana issues in your town? And he said, we spend, I've spent a, a, a couple of hours on it. And I was like, you're spending a couple hours a day on this issue? And he said, no, I've been here for four years. I have spent a couple hours on it, which was remarkable because most cities don't have that kind of positive relationship with the people, the purveyors, the delivery agencies, the, uh, the dispensaries, the growers, the cultivators in their jurisdictions. And so I asked him, why is that, John? Why is it that the city of Sacramento is doing such an exemplary job and it's not, it's not taking from your time as a city manager? And the answer was, we adopted the idea early on that this was inevitable and that it was going to happen. And the first stakeholders we sat down with was law enforcement and the directive that our, our city council members were told law enforcement was, you're going to have to make this work. You need to develop a community process and a stakeholder process that is going to work for you, work for the community, and then work for the purveyors. That began a many years long process to get stakeholder buy-in for the people that were actually gonna be selling in the community. And let me spend a little bit of time on this because it's important. As I mentioned, I've been working with local governments for 25 years, and in the past couple, I have seen literally dozens of new local government consultants showing up, telling you what you should be doing with your community. A lot of your people, especially in planning, are getting probably daily requests, right? How do I get a permit? Uh, most of these people are going to claim that they were the people that wrote the Colorado measure, right? They're the experts that started this stuff. I'm seeing heads nod because you've all had these experiences, Look, the, the way the, the, the recipe for success in a local government requires early buy-in from law enforcement, early buy-in from stakeholders, a commitment by the city council to make the policy work regardless of how it comes out. And then this is very important. When you sit down with people that either want to or are selling cannabis in your community currently, because again, it is happening, and you start a dialogue and a discussion that is thorough and complete and lasts over a period of time, a funny thing is going to happen. There's going to be a couple hundred at the first meeting. Then there's going to be a hundred at the second meeting. Then there's going to be about 70 at the next meeting. And as you start getting into the mechanics and into, into the weeds of the policy discussion, you're going to start seeing a thinning of people that are more serious purveyors and business owners that have a responsible commitment and stake to your community. And if they're working hand in glove with law enforcement nine times out of 10 through that process, when you have people who have actually got skin in the game that have helped develop the process with law enforcement and other stakeholders, not only do you build a relationship, but you end up with a really strong policy framework that actually works. 
Sacramento is the one city that I've seen do this effectively. Other cities have begun this, but I can give you a list of at least 25 or 30 cities where it has not worked. And that's where you see very significant law enforcement problems, very significant problems in the community, and a lot of bad actors. Because if there is one thing that responsible purveyors in your community do not want is bad actors. Okay? They're very keenly aware of their image, and they don't want it. They want to be legitimate enterprises that are helping out the communities. This is the website that we worked with and launched to uh, provide a resource. Uh, we have about 1,300 local government subscribers. If you just go to this website, we do best ordinances and practices. We give you updates on what's happening in local jurisdictions and local communities. It's read largely by city managers, police chiefs, law enforcement types, people in planning, those that are most directly affected by this emerging industry at the local level. There's this huge void at the local level on information. I'm sure in large part that's why you are here today. Uh, this is a way you can continue to get some of that information where it can be helpful. We do interviews and get opinion pieces from the different departments at the state, the different regulatory agencies, from legislators, from policymakers, from lawmakers, all designed to kind of give you some of the most best up-to-date information. Uh, the response to this was so, so overwhelmingly successful that we decided to formalize this into an association of cannabis regulators at the city and county level. If you are interested in getting more information, the association uh, just launched last week. It's headed up by two people. One is Joe Devlin, who's the chief enforcement officer on cannabis issues for the city of Sacramento. The other one is a woman by the name of Kat Packer, who's heading up in Los Angeles area. You do not have to be in a city that provides for the sale. Uh, you can, your city can have a ban if you just want to be involved to find out what's going on. Um, that's fine. City managers are welcome. Police chiefs are welcome. Anybody who's a city or county employee who's interested in learning more and networking with this. One of the reasons why we set this up for your help was there's been no such thing. There's no, been no profession before of cannabis regulators up until now. And uh, what we started to see was four or five different people with these new job titles, all of them different, focused on regulating what is happening on cannabis issues in their communities. None of them knew each other. None of them have a professional background in this space because it didn't exist. And what we're seeing is a real desperate need to professionalize the profession and provide an opportunity for, um, for more uh, discussion and dialogue. Here's how you can get a hold of me. I'm going to go ahead and leave it at that. I'm available for any questions afterwards. Hope I did okay on time there, Randy. But you can write me at madrid at grassrootslab.com is my email address. There's my cell phone number. And if you want to be really entertained and see a very aggressive Twitter handle, uh, go ahead and uh, follow me on Twitter. So those are the best ways to get a hold of me. I hope it's been helpful. We'll be around to answer any questions on the local government side. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. So a couple of uh, housekeeping things. Number one, we are receiving questions from folks over at the table. We will be addressing those as the panel appropriate for those questions comes up. Um, the next group will actually be a panel sitting up here. Um, myself and a couple of others will be coming up right now. I'm gonna get this going here. Um, I, however, I think the way we wanna do it is have each of us introduce ourselves as we, we begin to speak and kind of tell a history of who we are and our experience here and why we're here. Um, and then also we will be answering your questions as part of our proposal. We will go from this panel, and by the way, obviously I, I don't think I have to say this, we're not gonna take you know, little breaks since it's being televised as well. So just you know, feel free to go in and out of the room as we go. We're gonna go continually um, up to lunch. Uh, even if we're a little early, we'll break early for lunch, but we're gonna go up to lunch with this panel. Then we will have lunch. And after lunch, we will then bring in the banking panel and uh, current BOE chair, Fiona Ma and myself will be on that panel. And I think I can say she's actually uh, running unopposed also for state treasurer. So she'll be here around lunchtime. I think she'll be having lunch with us. So that's where we're at. Let me get this one going. Hope this is, boom. And let me catch up to where we were. Why isn't it going backwards? That's one we can. No. That's the first time. Is it? It's not working. 
I'm going forward and backward, and neither one's working. Oh, I know why. Duh. How about this? <laughs> now let me get to our side. There we go. So you guys want to have a seat? And I will, or, or Amir, you want to start? So you want to come up here and do it? Sorry about that. All right. Good morning, everybody. How are we doing? Good, good. Thank you for having us uh, here in Temecula. Um, as you can see, this, oh, wrong slide here. So the state's pretty much gone to pot. And just uh, for technicalities, uh, it is no longer called the uh, Bureau of Medical Marijuana Regulation. It's now the BCC, the Bureau of Cannabis Control, uh, just to make that that quick uh, technical adjustment. Um, that's Lori Ajax. She's the new head of the BCC. Uh, she's working under Dean, who you just saw earlier. Um, what I want to do today is I want to kind of get, uh, give you a little bit of perspective as to what's available to you as policymakers um, and kind of the, the lay of the land uh, of, of uh, the legislation that's been recently passed. It's a little bit confusing. There's been a lot of uh, they almost sound like diseases, MRSA, MACRUSA. Um, but those have, those have been the acronyms that have been uh, thrown around, and, and some people may get a little confused. So think of it almost like a stack of pancakes. So you had the MMRSA, which has now been changed to the MCRSA, just replacing marijuana with cannabis. So the MCRSA was the, uh, the three-pack of bills uh, that was introduced last year and, and passed, or, or I'm sorry, in 16. Um, that was then uh, remixed by the governor uh, to create the uh, Bureau of Cannabis Control and uh, kind of a local or a, kind of a licensing framework for this industry. Um, the key, key point that we want to drive home today is local control. Um, you as policymakers have the opportunity uh, to do whatever you like here. And, and, and it really comes down to the locals who know what's good for the local community. Um, oh, sorry. My name is Amir Deliri, by the way. Uh, I'm with Locan Venture Management. Um, we are involved in the, in the cannabis industry. Uh, we like to do things like this because we can really give uh, a full perspective of the opportunities and the pitfalls of, of regulating cannabis or banning cannabis um, in, your, in your jurisdiction. So what I want to do is I, I want to just really Amir, wait, I would like to Sorry. add the main reason Amir is speaking also, besides his experience in the cannabis industry, is uh, he was one of the people in the forefront on behalf of the industry negotiating on the legislation and on Prop uh, 64. So he was actually going around and advising as a consultant exactly what he said, where the problems were, you know, how to pick out and find the bad actors, folks who were, you know, uh, coming out of from underground and trying to actually uh, get by with their business without going through any regulatory process. Those folks will still be there. So, so Amir, when we met Amir, he was advising the industry on working with law enforcement, which is our background. Uh, he was w advising folks to work with us, work with the local elected officials, and one was, was uh, actually advising some of the local agencies as well. He has helped uh, local agencies draft their ordinances, has given them sample ordinances where on both taxation and enforcement, uh, other regulatory ordinances. So he has been around the state helping local governments as well uh, draft some of their ordinances. Thank you, Randy. Um, is there a way to get this back on? Is that right? Perfect. So Randy just said something very important. Um, you know, for many, many years, I've sat in many planning commission meetings, uh, many city council meetings, many board of supervisors meetings, and nobody had any idea of what to do. And a lot of regulators and, and electeds were like, you know, why, are, why is this being put on us? As you know, you have all this dynamic 
uh, activity happening in, in key places like Oakland and San Francisco. You had all these, you know, jurisdictions popping up saying, you know, dispensaries opening because of a, of a lack of regulation. Um, there was no basis to make any real policy on. Hence the MMRSA. The MMRSA laid a foundation for you uh, as policymakers. It gave you a guideline. It gave you political cover, if you will, um, to make those decisions and to regulate what's best for your community. Um, again, the most important thing here is local control. And you as locals know your city best. That, that's going to be the most important thing I want to drive home today is, is the local piece of this. You know what's best for your community. You know what works. You know what actors you want in. You know what actors you want out. And again, that's, that's the biggest uh, piece of this. Um, the MMRSA essentially drew the line in the sand uh, for what was the fiction of uh, medical cultivation and what's considered commercial cultivation. For so many years, you could go to a pot doc and get a script, and they said, hey, you know, you can grow 99 plants or possess 14 pounds, and, you know, a, a, a local uh, law enforcement uh, agency may interact with that and kind of have their hands tied. They don't really understand. Nothing was clear. Okay, so the MMRSA drew that clear line in the sand as to, hey, this is what's considered for your own personal use, and this is what's considered commercial activity. And if it wasn't connected to a, a retail dispensary that was properly organized under the uh, um, Attorney General guidelines, have a seller's permit, articles of incorporation as a mutual benefit, not, prof, not, for, not for profit, uh, very, very few of these operators had these type of things. So this drew that clear line in the sand. And uh, there's several agencies involved, uh, Department of uh, Justice, California Department of Food and Ag, State Water Board, like, uh, like Dean and Mike were saying. Um, everybody's on board now. These are some of the different agencies involved. Um, you've seen these uh, a couple times. A couple of these slides are a little bit redundant from uh, the earlier speakers. Um, but I want to dig a little bit deeper into the MMRSA and kind of give you guys some insight into uh, the different license types and the different industries associated with it, more of the mechanics of, of this whole thing that we're talking about. Um, so let's just dive into commercial cultivation, okay? Uh, commercial, commercial cultivation is considered uh, anything over six plants for your personal use. And if you're doing that in the state of California uh, come 2018, um, you're, you're not going to be on the, on the right side of things. So uh, we're ecstatic uh, that the state has stepped up and regulated probably one of the most valuable products in California's you know, uh, landscape. Um, it's going to be good for a lot of people, and it's going to be bad for a lot of people. So again, as policymakers, it's, it's your decision to really drive home that local flavor of what you want in your community. But at the same time, we want to know what's available to you uh, for you to make those informed decisions. So outdoor, uh, there, and, and let me just kind of oh, make, a, make a brief uh, wave of the wand here. There's three types of, or actually four types of cultivation. Uh, you have outdoor cultivation, which is a full term plant, which usually gets planted around Mother's Day and gets harvested you know, right around uh, mid-October to early November. Uh, then you have greenhouses, which is kind of a, a mix of outdoor and indoor because you're supplementing a little bit of light. They call that mixed light use. And then you have indoor, which is uh, it's done inside warehouses, it's done inside houses, it's done everywhere. Um, typical, you know, lifespan of a, of a flowering plant is anywhere from eight to ten weeks. Um, so you can kind of start to extrapolate the, the type of turns you get in terms of, of harvesting uh, plants. Um, based on that. So indoor, you can constantly and perpetually be harvesting. Um, greenhouses, kind of the same thing, depending on how you do your, your mixed light and your, and your runs. Uh, outdoor, you're typically doing one harvest a year. Um, three types of outdoor licenses. Uh, the specialty outdoor is a canopy. And I, I want to just kind of uh, define what canopy means. Canopy means uh, the space in which your, your, your plants are flowering. So. We could be in this room, it's you know, about a 10,000 square foot room. If, if half of this had flowering plants, that would consider, that'd be considered the canopy. 
as an example. So uh, the type one specialty outdoor, that's a 5,000 square, up to 5,000 square foot canopy. So it could be 1,000 square feet, 4,000 square feet, but anyway, up to 5,000. Uh, the small outdoor is 5,001 square feet to 10,000 square feet. And then the, uh, the big outdoor is 10,000 square feet and up. Um, we're seeing places like Humboldt, Mendocino, um, doing you know, up to one acre of canopy. Uh, I've seen up to one and a half acres up there. Um, little nebulous, we're not really sure exactly uh, who's you know, uh, measuring out the canopies and things like that. Again, that, that comes down to the locals. Um, so that's the first. Uh, the type three licenses are definitely gonna be capped. Um, that's, that's what we're hearing. Um, you know, what's, what's good in Humboldt may not be good in San Francisco. You know, what's good in Temecula may not be good for Butte County. It's, it's kind of the same thing. Again, that, that's what really comes down to the local control piece. Uh, the next is the indoor, and it's kind of the same scheme in terms of the canopy size, except for the type 3A indoor. Uh, that is 10,001 square feet up to 22,000 square feet of canopy. That is going to be the largest uh, indoor license that you can have in California. It's 22,000 square feet of canopy. Again, those will be capped as well. Um, so you're going to see very, very limited numbers of those uh, those, those uh, canopy licenses. And then the next is mixed light. So this is some kind of combination of using the sun and some type of supplemental light. Um, again, same thing. It's kind of the same, uh, uh, same framework, 5,000, 5,000 to 10,000, and then 10,000 to 22,000. Just to give you an idea, 22,000 square feet is just about a half an acre of, of land, more or less. So the other cultivation licenses, uh, those are the nursery licenses as well. Um, so the, the one, the, the, the genetic piece of this whole thing is, is the breeders, right? So they basically have strains that they have uh, either held for many, many years or have, you know, back crossed and created new strains. Uh, you know, there's a, a big uh, trend in, in genetically engineering uh, high CBD strains, you know, for the, for the medical use of cannabis. Um, so the nurseries are, are, a, are a license in itself. It's called a type four nursery license. Um, they can transport those live plants because they're typically delivering those plants uh, to the grow sites. Um, currently right now what you're seeing in, in uh, dispensaries is dispensaries are kind of like the, the filter point or the access point. So a grower typically can go to a dispensary uh, and buy clones or you know, uh, the baby plants uh, and then they take those and go to their own farms and, and plan away. Um, the specialty co cottage license, that's kind of more for like the, the North Coast because um, you have a lot of cr almost like craft brewers up there. Uh, so th there's been a special carve out for them. Uh, they're, they're definitely a big stakeholder in the industry. Um, so the specialty cottage license was, con uh, was created just for that specific purpose. And then you have the type five license. Now this was in Prop 64. Um, this basically put no limits on how much you can grow, and that's kind of the big tobacco, big alcohol, uh, big elephant in the room. But those have been pushed off uh, for discussion. To not, nothing's going to happen there until about 2023, and we we pretty much see uh, that being um, pushed off again. <clears throat> You go a little further down, downstream in the economic chain, uh, you have the type six and type seven licenses. Uh, those are for manufacturers. So those are the people that make the edibles, that make the pens, uh, that make the tinctures, that make the salves, that make the um, sublinguals, all of that type of stuff. And there's two different types. There's volatile and non-volatile. Uh, and when I talk about um, volatile and non-volatile, I'm talking about the cutting agents that they use. Some people use butane, some people use propane. Uh, those are examples of volatile, um, very dangerous. Um, you're seeing a lot of uh, people doing what they call open blasting. Open blasting is when you get a, a, a aerosol can of butane and you have a, a small you know, tube that you go get a, at a plastic store or, or a glass store somewhere and you basically just blast that uh, butane through the tube and out comes this oil. Well, the problem with that, a lot of people don't know, is butane is, is heavier than air. So it, it falls on the ground and it's just kind of laying there. People are smoking a joint as they're doing this and boom, the whole house goes up in flames. You've seen a lot of those all across the state. 
these big uh, butane explosions, very, very dangerous. Uh, the volatile solvents, the type sevens, those are gonna be a very highly scrutinized license, cl uh, license class. Um, but those are the two types of manufacturers. Uh, type, type eight is the testing lab. So those are the people who are testing for potency. They're testing for um, uh, cannabinoid profiles, uh, you know, high CBD, high THC, or some type of combination within there, uh, micro, uh, microorganisms, pesticides, uh, all these things that are being used. You know, most people don't know what they're smoking or what they're eating or, or, or whatever. Um, hence the, uh, the, the mandatory testing and, and, and a whole different or a whole new class of licensure, the, the type 8 for testing. Um, then you have the type 10, uh, which is the retailer or the dispensary or the storefront. Um, so those are typically your access points. Those are where you're getting test, you know, in an ideal world, you're getting tested product uh, that's being taxed, regulated, vetted by whoever is buying it because in a, in a perfect world, they should be test or they should be checking the, the uh, validation of the script or the, or the doctor's recommendation uh, that they're doing. So that's really your front line is the dispensary. Uh, from the retail standpoint. And we like to, uh, in our discussions and, and when we talk policy, we always like to talk about sale to seed instead of seed to sale. We believe that if you track the dollars, and, and this is you know, more uh, applicable here for the local uh, ordinances, um, we believe that if you track the dollars and systemically follow that back to the growers, to the manufacturers, to the testers, you can systemically... Um, uh, systemically, you can uh, regulate and have full transparency uh, of, the, of the transaction and all the way down the stream. Um, I'm not really a big fan of the seed to sale uh, model because it, there's just too much that, that goes by the wayside. If you track the money, which is a very important uh, piece for policymakers, that's where you're going to see the transparency. That's where you're going to see the clarity in this whole uh, marijuana business. Um, the type 11 is the distributor model or the distributor class. So there's, it's just like, uh, just like alcohol, Southern Wine and Spirits. Um, um, there's a couple. Uh, the, the Young's Market. Young's Market uh, those are a few of the liquor distributors here in California. Um, kind of the same, same concept. And, and believe it or not, uh, some of those early distributors and people who are advocating for this license class were people from big alcohol. Um, so... Those, uh, those license types are out there. Uh, for a while, they were mandated. You, it, it was going to be mandated that you had to have uh, a distributor distribute your product. Uh, that is no longer the case. Uh, Prop 64 uh, invalidated that, and then also Macrusa uh, did that as well. Um, the Type 12, that's a micro business. Uh, this is a current license class, and this was not reflected in uh, the MCRSA. Um, and basically what this allows you to do is kind of be like a fully functioning one-stop shop. So you can cultivate, uh, manufacture, and dispense all from one place, but, but a very small, I think it's like 12,000 square feet is the, is the max uh, square footage you can have for that. <clears throat> so there's limits on cross license, yes sir. That's correct. So, so basically, when a dispensary is is buying product, and and currently the so there's there's a couple different models of of sales, right? You have a a dispensary that can be vertically integrated, meaning they grow all their own product and they they push it out of their store, or you have the the vending model. Uh, the vending model is is probably the most common. Uh, very few dispensaries are are fully uh, vertically integrated. Um, the vending model is, is is probably the most applicable uh, um, play to uh, to what you're talking about, sir. Um, basically, dispensaries will have a bunch of growers coming to them every Tuesday between three and six, or whatever the days are, um, and they're bringing you know pounds of weed, and it's typically a sample. Um, 
And, and a dispensary will say, hey, yay or nay, um, but they'll, they'll, they'll demand a lab test. And so what, what they'll do is they'll take a sample of that herb. Again, there's no chain of custody right now. It's very, very loosey-goosey. We don't really know what's really happening. Uh, but in, in the new regime, if you will, um, product's gonna have to be tested, sealed, the chain of custody is all gonna be there. So you're gonna know where it's coming from, what's inside it, uh, what's, you know, what, it's, what pesticides have been used, if, if or not. Um, and then to, to kind of touch back on the testing lab and separate facility, they, they've, uh, the MMRSA or the MCRSA uh, put limits on cross-licensing. So you can't be a cultivator and own a, a testing lab as well, right? It's kind of the, it's kind of the separation or bifurcation of, uh, of those. Um, very similar to the Tide House regulations for alcohol. Um, <clears throat> Typical background check, uh, very similar to like the ABC, like applying for a liquor license, you know, proof of funds, DOJ, FBI background check, um, fees, uh, suitability factors, kind of drawing on things from like uh, gaming, uh, background checks for gaming, background checks for alcohol. It's kind of the same concept. That's kind of how the bureau, the genesis of the bureau has happened. And I'm gonna turn into the civil penalties and law enforcement stuff here. Okay. Hi, I'm Jonathan Feldman. I'm the head lobbyist for the California Police Chiefs Association. Uh, thanks for having us up here. We appreciate your time. Uh, just a quick history of the Chiefs Association and our involvement in all of this. Uh, we were one of the sponsors of Assembly Bill 266, the medical regulatory package that went into place in 2015. Uh, we partnered with the League of Cities and a few other groups in sponsoring part of that legislation. Uh, the discussion amongst the chiefs, which was controversial at the time, you know, half of them just didn't want to have anything to do with it. The other half realized that, hey, this stuff is legal. It's been here. It's unregulated. We need to put something in place. Uh, and if someone's going to do it, it might as well be us. Uh, that side of the argument won, clearly. And we went forward with crafting language that, I mean, we keep talking about local control, um, but that, that, was, that was at the forefront of every part of our conditions for being part of that discussion, is ensuring that there was some measure of local control. And I, I you know, the way our state system is set up, the state sits over the locals. Yes, there is a lot of this that is being governed and run by the state. And that's just the way it is. Same thing with the federal government. The federal government sits over state government. State government sits over local government. You don't have complete control, but you do have a measure of local control that allows you to govern uh, how this is really going to roll out in your community. You do have a say. And so that, that was part of you know, our engagement in it from the beginning. Uh, we opposed Prop 64. We were one of the leading groups in opposition to it. Uh, we were uh, sitting on the campaign committee against it. You know, we opposed it for philosophical reasons uh, the chiefs had against uh, adult use. Uh, we also opposed it for specific policy concerns that we had. But in the end of the day, voters spoke. Uh, we participated in the reconciliation between the two when you had to take medical and adult use and put them together. Uh, we fought for things, funding for DREs, those are drug recognition experts. I'll talk a little bit more about that as one of our priorities going forward. Uh, we fought for uh, a independent inspections, notifications to law enforcement of diversion and theft, local outreach, things like that were priorities to us. We also uh, pushed for more advertising restrictions. Uh, which we didn't get through the legislature, but it's anticipated that there will be some additional restrictions coming forward in the regulations as they come out. Uh, those have all been our, our big priorities going forward. You know, law enforcement, local law enforcement, derives a lot of our powers not just from the penal code, but from local ordinances. The California Constitution, Constitution specifically gives us that authority uh, through what the local ordinances allow, you know, conditionalize the city to, to, uh, to permit. And that's, that's where a lot of that power comes from. So as you start developing these ordinances and looking at how are we gonna allow this, how are we not gonna allow it, uh, 
those ordinances are really going to give law enforcement the tools or handcuff them in certain ways. So it's important that you, you look really closely at, at how you're crafting that, what you're allowing, what you're not. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about the impacts that we're anticipating that we're seeing in other states. As, so as you start drafting your ordinances and you start looking into factors that you need to consider when you put these together, uh, you'll at least have them in mind. The Rocky Mountain High Intensity Drug Trafficking Area uh, releases reports every year. They've been tracking specific statistics related to the legalization of adult use marijuana in Colorado uh, since 2009, I believe. You know, I get, I get, we get into arguments about statistics all the time, so I'm going to, you know, flat out just from the get-go say facts are stubborn, stubborn, statistics are pliable. We all know this. Uh, we can argue about these statistics later, but they're there. I'm just going to mention some of them so that this is part of your thought process. That's all I want to accomplish in doing this. Uh, Marijuana-related traffic deaths. If you look at the three-year average after legalization in Colorado and before, it's 49% higher afterwards. Youth use, if you look at the two-year average before and after legalization, 20% uh, higher. And when you look at hospitalizations related to marijuana exposure, likely related to marijuana exposure, also same thing, increases after at a higher rate than before. Uh, not to say that these are statistics that should scare everyone away from legalization. I mean, they're things that are happening now. But these are things that when you look at how you're going to uh, position yourself and position your law enforcement agencies in Im impacting this, things that you have to consider. You, there have to be resources put towards uh, more protections for driving under the influence. There have to be resources put towards uh, school resource officers, outreach to children. Uh, mitigate those impacts as best you can. They're happening anyway, so you know there's, there's a give and take of, well, should we just ban it then and, and walk away? You know, that's, that's not gonna stop the, the impacts from hitting your community. Addressing them specifically through ordinances, through resources to law enforcement will. Going on to, before I move, uh, on DUID, driving under the influence of drugs, uh, it's really critical right now that you look at you look at the best ways to address that. It's public outreach. It's it's letting the public know that you know a lot of people think that just driving stoned is not an issue. They that's uh, some I've heard actually say I drive better when I'm stoned. I go a little slower, a little safer. Uh, you know. It's, <laughs> Getting past those arguments, it, th there are statistics that show that it's, it's clearly it's impaired driving. We know that at a certain level it is, but it's hard to prove that. There's no per se standard for marijuana in this state. There are in other states. Other states have nanogram levels where if it's in your blood at a certain level, then you're deemed impaired. We don't have that. Uh, the argument has been, and we tried. We've run bills through the legislature. They always get killed. Uh, Argument being, nanograms, it's in your blood. Marijuana is in your blood longer than you are impaired by it. So if you're a habitual user, it might be in your system for days and weeks. And it's not necessarily going to tell law enforcement that you're impaired. So if a DA goes to prosecute and says, hey, they have it in their blood, public defender, all they have to say is, well, that's just from their habitual use. They're a patient or, or whatever. Um, they weren't impaired at the time. There is technology that's coming out that could help in this situation. We're looking at breathalyzers that are gonna actually tell how recent your use has been. But with that, you have to then prove that recent use in that time period correlates to impairment. If I've got a breathalyzer that can say, yes, you've used within the last two hours, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're impaired because we don't have the scientific evidence yet to show that impairment is, is within that two hour period. But we're working towards that. Right now, our best bet is uh, DREs, drug recognition experts. It's highly trained officers that can go out into the field, actually run tests, field tests. Uh, they will come testify in court against an individual. That is the best way to successfully prosecute someone for a DUID. Uh, 
we were successful in the reconciliation of uh, securing $3 million that's being passed through CHP to train more DREs. There's about 700 in the state right now. That's not nearly enough for the millions and millions of uh, traffic incidents that we experience every single year. Um, but that is something that if you look at your ordinance and look at resources to law enforcement to mitigate some of the concerns that I've mentioned, uh, you know, and I'm, I, I know we've got our law enforcement table in the back, and I don't want to, you know, be speaking out of turn. They might have other issues. Definitely consult with them over me. But from from our association, from the general sense, from law enforcement and the chiefs that I speak with, uh, that is a huge priority, making sure that we have more trained DREs in the state. Um, you know, diversion, inversion is a huge issue. We're looking at making sure that we have a robust track and trace system that follows uh, the plant from beginning to end. The more information that we can collect, the better. We've uh, toured Colorado, looked at how their system is up and running. Uh, it allows law enforcement pretty good access to find exactly where the plant is in the chain, where it's come from. Uh, and so we're, we're working right now with uh, Department of Consumer Affairs and CDFA to make sure that their regulations are strong enough that we collect the information that we need to collect so that we can track that and make sure that we're not allowing diversion or inversion. Um, you know, what we kind of expect going forward, we expect there to be a, an associated crime increase um, as, the, as the market starts emerging and it moves out of the black market uh, you know, cartels are still very present in the state. You know, they're, they're buying track houses, setting up indoor grows, working illegally. They're still here. And then you've got soft targets, these businesses coming online with uh, large influxes of cash. You know, in some of the northern region, the, the homicide increases are directly related to marijuana operations, uh, mostly the illegal ones, the regulated ones. You know, you can put safety precautions in. You can put... Uh, requirements, of video monitoring. Um, you know, in Colorado, law enforcement in some areas actually has systems that allow them to tap into the videos, uh, cameras in each grow shop, and they can cycle through it, and they can actually be from a centralized location monitoring what's happening in the different grow shops that they have in the state. Uh, we're working with some of the companies out in Colorado to see how we can bring that technology and make it available to our law enforcement departments here in the state. Um, but these are all these these are our big uh, issues as we as we look to move forward. You know, we all know that it's here; it's not going anywhere. Um, ensuring that we we manage it the best po way possible is uh, our task moving forward. So that's it for me. Yeah, we have well, we have several questions, but again, we'll. We'll get through this real quick and then we'll spend, I think, quite a bit of time on the questions. We have a lot of them. Um, just very quickly on the current penalties so you guys know what's going on. Um, where are we on the slides? I'll put it up. Um, so right now, you know, uh, what happened is each time one of these bills or, or the uh, adult use uh, initiative, Prop 64 Path, they did always deal with penalties. They dealt with law enforcement issues. Um, so my name is Randy Perry. I've been representing rank and file law enforcement officers for 35 years. Um, with, and I also currently still represent for 35 years the largest uh, law enforcement association in the United States. And so we were at the table, the group, the name of the organization is called PORAC. And we were at the table from day one. It was actually the first bill introduced was a about six years ago, I mean a, a real bill. And we were at the table uh, for about the first three years, the legislation kept failing. Uh, folks just couldn't come to agreement. And a lot of the opposition really, and a lot of the reason the bills died was from the industry itself. You had the large growers versus the small growers. You had people who wanted to do uh, uh, all the transportation. They wanted kind of like the Young's Market and things like the tight house rules. And then others who said, no, if I'm a, a, a grower and I have four trucks, I'm going to transport my own product. So it was, uh, it was a, a major battle. We were at the table, and I specifically on behalf of PORAC was at the table. Uh, when the three bills you saw passed, we were at the table asking 
for several things on law enforcement's behalf. We were opposed to all the measures until the very end. We, PORAC basically asked for six things, some of them of which Jonathan discussed already. All six things were accepted into the bills and actually into Prop 64 as well. Um, a couple of the main issues that were important to the rank and file law enforcement folks that I represent was that we could go into a dispensary and they would have to make their uh, inventories available to us. One of the largest issues we have found that was currently happening in California and then was happening in other states was a dispensary would bring in, you know, 10 pounds of cannabis and were selling for that week two pounds and eight pounds were going out the back door to other states. And that was a major issue, it is still a major issue happening. Um, the regulatory scheme in the state agency is trying to deal with that issue, but one of the things we wanted is full access to the inventories. So they'd show us what has come in the front door and what has gone back out the front door. And then we could look at what they still have. Keep in mind, a lot of these products, you know, can only last so long. I mean, they can't sit, at, you know, they don't have a shelf life. Some of them don't have a shelf life of, you know, two, three, four weeks. So we will know what happened to those. Um, the other very important issue was exactly what Jonathan talked about, the whole track and trade where, you know, you're literally putting a, a bar, uh, um, a scan, a bar scan on a plant once it hits a certain age or height is what they're measuring or negotiating right now. And that bar scan lets you track that plant and everything from that plant all the way to the consumer. So those are things that were very important to us. Statewide database was probably our largest argument. We, uh, as you know, under Prop 215 and then the subsequent legislation, they always try to protect the identity because at that, up to this point, it's been for patients and you have to provide or protect the identity of patients. And quite frankly, folks who were growing uh, their, their six plants or 12 immature plants or up to the 99, which came after Prop 215, um, they were very nervous if their name went on any kind of list that law enforcement would then have their name on the list. And uh, so that's been a difficult part of this, but through the legislation, we were able to get a statewide database um, for, uh, on the adult use side, it's going to be important. One important factor, uh, one question we, we get a lot is, well, why would anybody be a, be a patient any longer if it's going to be legal if you're over 21? And I thought it was very clever where the state turned around and said, well, for, for medical cannabis and for patients, you can buy your cannabis uh, with, with no state tax. And so I personally believe that the patient list is going to grow <laughs> as people save on sales tax. Um, it'll be interesting. But I actually like that idea because we can track the patients and the patient lists will be uh, something that law enforcement will have access to there will be restrictions, it's still developing, there will be restrictions on how and what we can do with that information, like we have on any, you know, 5150 or someone that we deal with now with a mental issue or a health issue. Um, however, keep in mind, and we're going to go into this uh, deep in a minute, keep in mind that the feds are, with, with the federal government, cannabis is still a Schedule One drug, is still illegal, and... Uh, um, however, they did come out with what was called the Cole Amendment, which came out of the Attorney General's Office, DOJ, in the last administration. That Cole Amendment dealt specifically with medical cannabis. Um, and since then, for the last four years, there's been a congressional amendment called the Rohrbacher, Rohrbacher, boy, if he's your congressman, I feel sorry for you, um, uh, Far Amendment, Sam Farr is out of the Monterey uh, uh, Peninsula area. They have passed an amendment, successfully got an amendment into the state appropriation or the U.S. appropriations bills stating that the uh, no federal dollars can be spent, even especially out of DOJ, on going after states who have legally regulated and passed medical cannabis. Um, so that has passed again this year. So uh, basically, legally, they can't have their agents go after a, any uh, medical cannabis from a state that has officially passed it by the voters and has a regulatory process in place. Um, however, 
with Mr. Sessions in as the Attorney General now, one of the earliest comments he made as the new Attorney General, he said, at this point, we are going to stick in with the Cole Amendment with some minor changes, which we haven't seen any changes yet, but they are going to, their administration is going to stay with the Cole Amendment on medical cannabis and no states who are rate, fully regulating medical cannabis. Um, so what that tells you is any dispensary, any cultivator, manufacturer, any part of the industry dealing with cannabis, if they are working with medical cannabis, and they can prove that they're working, that the people they're working with have, you know, what's a script or a doctor's uh, prescription, then they have a certain level of protection that the adult use or recreational use folks won't have. And that's simply because this administration has stated more than one occasion, at least five that I know of, that they will stick by the Cole Amendment and they're limited by the, uh, I'll just say the Farr Amendment versus Rohrbacher. Um, and so those, that, that, is a, that is a very clear line of sand. Having said that, there is nothing stopping, and we're going to go into this in more detail, the more federal relationship, because there were some good discussions out here before this seminar started. Um, we're going to talk about the banking industry and the movement there. But there is very clear agreement among public safety, banking, and elected officials that until there is the proverbial act of Congress, until Congress literally goes in and either um, changes or reduces where cannabis is on the schedule, on the drug schedule, or they provide some type of uh, legislation that protects those states and literally states in law that states who have passed and regulated, you know, basically codify the Cole Amendment. Um, until they do that, the federal government still has cannabis as a, as a, as a uh, Schedule One drug, right there with heroin and, and other drugs. So, what it's come down to is a states' rights issue. And I can tell you right now, this state we're in, they are loving going head to head with Trump on everything and anything. But on the cannabis side, you have seen the governor, the attorney general, the state treasurer, the state controller, all step, the board of equalization have all stepped up and said, for cannabis trade in California, we will do what we can to protect the will of the voters in our state and to protect medical cannabis, at the very least, protect anyone doing business in California. So it is a state's rights issue. I just want to bring that up because there's, you know, question about, well, we keep talking about local control, local control. Well, how much control do you actually have if it's really a, a big fight between the feds potentially coming in anytime they want? States saying, no, you won't. This is a state's rights issue, and our voters have, have spoken. Um, truly, and, and with the voters again talking, you know, uh, approving adult use under Prop 64. How much control do you really have? Well, you have a lot of control because all the laws that have passed here says that the locals must approve it before any licensing will happen. And all the laws have stated you cannot legally do anything in the industry without being licensed. And starting January 1st of 2018, it will be illegal. So you can see up here, the statutes, the, the penalties are stiff. They are going after, on January 1st, they are going after illegal, um, illegal grows, illegal uh, sales, and they're trying to bring this out of the dark. They're trying to bring this industry out of the dark under the guise of if it's legal and people are doing it in storefronts that are regular, that the cartels will not have a strong foothold in the market any longer. And so that is the idea, that's the hope. It's going to take years and years to find out whether that's truly working. Um, on, on the local government front, I just want to emphasis, emphasize that you can say no. You can say no, we are not allowing it here. 
because here's what's going to happen. As the director of DCA said, when there's an application of any aspect of this industry to the state for that license or to the one of the other agencies giving the license, they will contact your city or county and will say, ask you, and they will give you a form to fill out. Is this person, do you know this person? What is your knowledge of this person? Have they filed locally? Are they approved locally? Um, in other words, are they in good standing with your city where they have uh, filed their application to do that business? And you will have the power to say yes or no. If you say, we don't know them, they haven't applied, or I'm sorry, but we do not allow anything in our city, or they apply for a dispensary or a store, but you have only approved cultivation, for example. Um, you say no. They will not be able to do that legally in your city. They may move to another city, reapply, and they do allow it, but in your city or county, in your jurisdiction, they will not get a license from the state of California. And if they attempt to do it, they will be illegal and will be subject to the enhanced penalties now kicking in in January. So, you know, I can't stress it enough. I know some of you, and we even had a question up here saying, look, saying that we have, a, saying that we have, you know, local governments have any control is, is inaccurate. It's not. It's not. So, um, I mean, look, I got to tell you, this guy right here and the League of California Cities and our organization fought hard for local control to maintain that. Just for that reason, it was it, you. You know, the state's saying we have a state right fight with the feds. Well, it's the same fight you guys have with the state on an ongoing basis. So that's where we're at on it. Um, I don't know where we're at on these slides. Anyway, these are just some of the sections. Um, what's happening are the collectives that were created in 215 are being phased out. They're allowing them to be phased out, um, but they will be gone. So everything will be fully licensed to come in January. Is there anything on this that you wanted to address at all? <clears throat> this guy is the expert on collectives and the whole bit because it is a quagmire. You know, so one, of the, one of the jokes we have in our office is every time I testified on one of the cannabis bills, I always threw out the issue. I said, folks, you don't understand. When an officer, one of, one of our members pulls somebody out, and it became like the joke because it was the example I used every single year, over and over and over. Um, officer pulls somebody over at two o'clock in the morning and they have two pounds in their car. And they say, oh, I'm a patient. Well, okay, show me, you know, whatever you have to show your prescription. Well, I don't have one. Well, what do you mean you don't have one? Well, people don't understand. Prop 215 said that a doctor could either, either give you a prescription, a letter, or a verbal approval. So you have a cop going, how the hell do I know that, that you're a patient? So at that point, our officers are having to make a decision. Is this somebody who's running weed for the cartel? So what, or am I gonna let them go? Most of the time it just dealt with how much weed they had on them. They had a few ounces, they may let them go. And if they, you know, say here's my doctor, you can call them in the morning, they're willing to do all that. But if they have several pounds, they're generally going to take them in, weigh everything, put it into evidence, arrest them, run them, book them, do the whole bit. In the morning at 9 o'clock when their doctor comes in, they call, the doc gets on the phone, yeah, he's my patient. So you got to turn around, re-weigh everything, put it back out, let the person, out. I mean, and you know, the officer could be off the street for the rest of the evening. If something. So it was a nightmare. So I'm telling you, these regulations and what we have worked to get into these regulations, again, PORAC opposed Prop 64. Um, but, you know, we saw the polling. We knew it was happening. So we made a decision five, six years ago that we were going to try and get as much of the regulatory work and the things that would help the officers on the street and help the district attorneys when they are going after the cartels and others um, to deal in this, uh, this area. And we feel pretty good about it. We feel pretty good about the language that's gone into all of it and the regulations that are coming out, even though we haven't seen the final ones yet. But we have been part of the regulatory process. We've been in meeting with them and talked to them about our issues. Um, these are just basically all the different agencies who are going to be involved in enforcement here. Um, hold on. I, 
I just started wearing glasses about two weeks ago. So, um, so basically, you, you've heard people talk about all this. I mean, you're going to have a lot of law enforcement out there. And there are going to be a lot of task force are going to start being set up, like you have the Ag Commissioners, Food and Ag Inspectors. I mean, they're state employees. So those state employees are going to have be set up with local law enforcement. They're going to be working task force. DOJ and local law enforcement work a lot of task force now. So it'll be a similar to that. And then you're going to have the agency who will be overseeing you know, all the law enforcement uh, duties. They have asked for the California, Associ or the California Highway Patrol um, to basically kind of be the state enforcement folks are still working through all of that. Um, I actually also represent the High California Association of Highway Patrolmen. Um, so we, we're working with the agencies and all of that. The law enforcement piece to us is one of the most important aspects of this industry. Just like it was with alcohol. It, if the law enforcement, and Mike, I thought Mike Madrid hit it right on the head. If law enforcement is brought in early and you sit down with them and you sit down with people who, are, or who you consider to be good actors, business people who would like to get into this industry simply for the business of it or who somebody that we've dealt with in the past now you know i'm pointing this way um a billionaire whose mother was completely helped with her cancer in her last two years of life he has he he is adamantly opposed to drugs drug abuse he helps he donates a lot of money but this guy has put a lot of money into the cannabis area because he is about the business aspect of it. He's about testing. He said, I wanted to know what my mom was taking. And when my mom goes to a dispensary because she is trying to stop the pain or her cancer or help her sleep at night, I want my mom to know what's in that, in that edible or what she's going to have to smoke or something. So he has been involved now for about four years, and he's putting his money where his mouth is. And so getting people like that in early with law enforcement to figure out what is our community uh, willing to do, and that's the polling that Mike's talking about, you have to go out to the community. And then once you find that out, bring in the people that are important on that, and law enforcement is gonna be the key on that. Letting them know, uh, first of all, talk to me about what you're doing now, and then secondly, if we allow any portion of this, what will that mean to you? And what can we do to help you? One example, and we'll, we're using the city of Sacramento because most, even the other states have come to Sacramento and they're looking at Sacramento as a city who's actually doing it right. And they started a long time ago, as Mike threw out. city of Sacramento ratcheted up their fees for applications. I think one application for one CUP, conditional use pay, is about $130,000. And so what they're doing with that money is they completely are using that money uh, once they take out their administrative costs of, of funding up their new department with Joe Devlin, Mike talked about starting this new association, the rest of the money, has they've created a cannabis SWAT team. And they have a lot of cartels in Sacramento area. They have a Chinese and uh, Vietnamese network happening right now where they've tracked, Joe Devlin told us this just last week, they've tracked to one person who has come in how many homes? Has he? Over 100. Over 100 homes recently. And they've tracked to, through his attorney in New York. And they think that's just the tip of the iceberg. So what Sacramento has done is they are using these fees that they're collecting on, on, on uh, cultivation, manufacturing, distribution, and, uh, the, and storefronts on dispensing. They have collected these fees from every person that they, is seeking a license whether or not you get that license. And they're, they're funding this SWAT team. This SWAT team is going out sim purely after illegal grows, illegal dispensaries. So that's how they plan on <laughs> weeding out. That's how they plan on getting rid of all the illegal stuff and strongly regulating what is happening in their city at the same time. So that's just an example there. So let me... Uh, just kind of move up. So here's where cannabis comes from in your area. This is very interesting. You know, it's funny. I, I mean, it's not funny to Matt. I can tell you that right now. It wasn't funny when we brought this up this morning at breakfast. But Amir was just at breakfast looking up, hmm, let's look at Temecula. Temecula, which does not allow anything at this point. Temecula has six dispensaries that we know of. 
They have how many distributors? Uh, Twenty. They have uh, six, six, uh, sorry, six storefronts uh, currently, and there's over twenty dispenser or twenty uh, mobile uh, deliveries in the Temecula area. And we found that on Weed Maps this morning. And by the way, Weed Maps is a wonderful tool for law enforcement. <laughs> <laughs> exactly where is that dispensary? Hmm. Because I I thought that was a little shoe store or something opening up. We'll have to go visit them. Yeah, Weed Maps is a great tool. Um, but anyway, it's, it's, it's interesting that you go into all of these cities and counties who have either banned or have done a, you know, a temporary hold till they can get you know, kind of their, their, their feet on the ground in terms of regulatory issues, um, how much is happening already in that city. So um, I think on the law enforcement side, and, and we can go back to, and we'll start answering some of these questions. I think on the law enforcement side, when is, what a city needs to do is sit down and figure out exactly what is right for them. If it's no, we can't do it, or we're not going to do it, our voters have spoken, or just our polling clearly shows we don't want this, it's potentially dangerous, uh, it's a cash business, on and on, then I think you need to sit down with your law enforcement figure out, then how are we going to get rid of the six storefronts, the 20 deliveries? So how are we going to do that? And you need to be serious about, you know, it's going to be a financial issue for you. Um, and you need to really make a plan because there's something else to think about. And Mike brought it up briefly also. There's a leakage issue on the financial side. But also there's an issue of what we call the island. And if you're the island that is banned and everyone around you is allowing, then the idea or the theory is, and they're enforcing the, the illegal you know, activity. They're enforcing it like Sacramento with their SWAT team. There have been some complaints of cities around Sacramento that the illegals are leaving and going right next door, just out of, this, out of Sacramento City. Um, so if you're an island city, that could be, that is, that's a theory that could happen. We don't know yet because it's not fully legal yet. So we'll see, we're, we're, we're gonna see over the next couple of years what that's like. If you make a decision to do any type of, allow any type of industry, whether it's just uh, cultivation, just distribution, because you know they're gonna be driving through your city anyway, so you want it regulated. You wanna make sure you know when you're in your city, they have to provide their license plates. You know, it's almost like an Uber situation where you're gonna know which cars, you can regulate how much they carry in that car, so if somebody, you know, somebody robs them or something, it will be, you know, it's like this, the sign you see, you know, we don't, we don't carry any cash for like blueprint distributor, um, that, kind of, that kind of issue. Um, but if you allow any part of it, you have to bring law enforcement in, you have to figure out how to fund this program, um, and you have to bring in all the stakeholders to let them know exactly what you're thinking. So there's no question that you may allow cultivation, but there will be no sales in our city or vice versa, that kind of an issue. You have to bring law enforcement in because they're the ones that are gonna have to enforce the bad actors and all these new laws that we have up here. Okay, anything yeah. else you guys wanna add before we start to some questions? Yeah, I'll just, I'll just real quick on that yeah, point because it is, it is uh, dovetails into kind of things I was talking about. When you look at what you're going to require for all these licenses, you can require them to give you certain information. Uh, and that's going to be really critical for law enforcement to know who's out there, who are the legitimate actors and who are not. Uh, when we talk about home grows, everyone can grow. Now, no matter what, it's the one thing you can't ban is home grows. Everyone can grow six plants. Uh, you, can, you can ban it being outdoor because of the nuisance issues. You, know, you have some authority here. But you can also require them to, to register with you. There's, there's a level of regulation that you can put on those home grows that will help law enforcement know what's out there so they can differentiate between the legal ones and the illegal ones. You know, we talk about the cartels buying homes, and I've seen photos of it from law enforcement agencies in L.A., San Francisco, northern parts of the state. The, they just rip the house out and set up grow shops. Uh, it's uh, in incredible. Uh, you see the ceilings are sagging from all the weight and the water weight from the plants up top and the mold on the walls. I mean, it's terrible for neighborhoods where these homes go in. So helping law enforcement identify, you know, where the legal ones are so they can help really go after those illegal ones is going to be huge. 
you know, if you go too far with regulating the indoor grows, you will face litigation. At least there's one city right now currently being sued. Uh, Fontana, they set a um, monetary requirement. You had to pay, I think, $400 or something for your indoor uh, to, to cultivate your six plants indoors. And ACLU sued them, saying that that was an infringement on their statutory right to grow indoors. It was too much of a burden. So do be careful if you start setting that uh, those requirements a little too high. You are setting yourself up for possible litigation. But you do want to at least see what's out there, see what other cities have done, see what information they've required to be submitted so that you will help law enforcement, again, uh, manage those issues. And just to, just to touch on uh, the home grows, um, you know, if, if you don't regulate um, commercial growing in your, in your city, you're going to have a, a proliferation. And when, I, when I mean regulate, that's either a ban or you embrace it. Um, but what you're going to see is a proliferation of, of house grows. And what does that do? It creates a public safety issue for you uh, because you, those become soft targets for robberies. Uh, it damages the housing stock. You know, you're creating mildew and, and, and uh, you know, depleting the property value. So it's a really big problem, especially for a community like Temecula. It's, it's a very, you know, very applicable case here. Um, it's, it's very important to get a handle on that. Uh, an example that the city of Sacramento did uh, was to, type, to kind of mitigate the crime problem with the personal use because it is a statutory right um, now, was they banned all outdoor cultivation. So if you want to do your own personal grow in your, for your own personal needs, uh, you had to do it indoor. And I think there's a, a registration process that's being developed within the city right now that's going to kind of give, give, the, uh, uh, give the city an idea of who's, where, who's, uh, who's doing what and where. Um, but it, it's, it, it, that's that type of transparency that you want. You don't want to turn a blind eye to it. You want to embrace it, get in front of it, and figure out what you want to do as a community. All right, let's get all these questions. We have a lot of question cards here. Um, let's get to some of these because they're very important. Some of them I think we've touched on. Um, we'll still repeat them and reiterate. What are the thoughts on federal law versus county ordinances? Uh, obviously the feds, we already touched upon that. Feds still prohibit it um, until there is an act of Congress doing you know, several different ways they can approach it. Um, then then you know, cities and counties are gonna make the decision based on you know, their own local ordinances and on state law. In state law, it's legal. And you, like I said before, you've had the top um, the attorney general, the governor, and other folks state that it's legal in California, and they will fight the federal government on this issue. So until they get the state's rights issue settled or there's statutory change at the federal level, it's a, it's a Schedule One drug. Yeah. And I'll add to that. Uh, I was at a meeting in the northern region with our northern police chiefs. Uh, USDEA was there. Uh, we always connect with our federal law enforcement partners to find out what they're doing. And the chiefs were asking the DEA agent, you know, hey, can you send us some resources for the illegal grows that we're dealing with? Uh, DEA agent's response was basically with opioids and heroin and methamphetamines uh, exploding right now all over the place. Uh, it's more prevalent on the East Coast, but it is making its way out here. That is the priority. Uh, basically, good luck with the other stuff. So uh, not to say that there isn't going to be uh, federal enforcement on marijuana in this state. Uh, I've heard of uh, uh, stuff in the works, but it's going to be very limited in scope, um, very targeted. And uh, I mean, it really comes down to a bandwidth priorities issue, and this is, I don't think this is going to be one. Next question, what will the state be accepting as confirmation of local approval? It's our understanding, it's too bad Dean had to leave, it's our understanding, it'll, like I said earlier, it'll be a document, it'll be sent to someone that you have dedicated to receive these documents, because you may receive a lot of them, and uh, it'll be a document wherein it'll have a, a questionnaire, and then you send that back to them, and they will respond accordingly. Yes, we've received it, the whole bit. So it'll be a document they'll be sending you. That's, that's what we've been told to this point. Yeah, I will say that we had an argument in the governor's office about this about a month ago. Uh, League of Cities, counties, uh, I was involved. Our concern was that they're just going to accept any kind of form, official-looking uh, 
saying that, that we verifying that we did have local approval. And our concern was we wanted to make sure that, that, that there's a ping system where they actually reach out to us and we forward the, the approval to them. It's not the licensee going in and saying, hey, yeah, here's our, here's our verification for you. So they will be reaching out directly to you. And I, yeah, as Randy said, it will be some kind of form that you will fill out and send back. Now we've got a question here. Uh, when they say six plants, is there a size limit? Is six plants equal to six seeds? So um, the way a lot of jurisdictions have approached this is they've uh, enacted a canopy size. Uh, so they'll say, they'll say six plants within 100 square feet, um, as an example. Uh, six seeds, uh, you don't know if you're going to get a male or female seed, so it's a bit nebulous. But uh, the six plant, um, 100 square foot canopy seems to be the, uh, the standard that's, that's happening across the state. So that, that would be kind of a way to, to kind of contain that, that uh, personal use clause there. Yeah. Um, so, what is the right level of taxation to balance the community's regulatory and enforcement costs and the need for private enterprise to make a reasonable profit? Uh, you know, this this is a, a interesting debate, and we've actually had a lot of discussions about this at the Capitol too. Uh, taxing this product is is. It will have an impact on diversion, inversion, the business, public health, everything. If you look at studies that show as the tax level goes up, where does it start incentivizing the black market? A lot of them that we've looked at say right around 15%. If you tax more than that, you're incentivizing people to undercut it through the black market. Now, if you go too low, you you're, have the possibility to flood the market with a the product. There you get the public health impacts. Uh, the state taxes right now, cumulative, are 25%. So we're already above the, the level where we're incentivizing the black market. There are cities that are throwing on an additional 20% tax on top of that. So you got 45% taxes on this product. Uh, now we do know that once we turn on the switch for the legalization and, and the regulatory market and everything gets running, uh, the flood of product is gonna drop the price you know, higher quantities, lower, lower price point, basic economics. So that might help balance things out, but we have discussed, uh, and I've discussed with the League of Cities about working to reduce the tax rate at the state level so there's more room for the locals to have a piece. But do beware, uh, you are already at, where you, where you come into the discussion about what the tax rate should be, you're already at the point that we're incentivizing the black market. So. Be careful. One example is in New York, there's a study that we all used on the tobacco side where the first time New York put $2 tax on their tobacco, um, their black market tripled on cigarettes. And so that is something that we've always watched on the tobacco tax initiatives here in California. We've, uh, we've actually flown out one of the top folks who are the expert from New York on tobacco uh, to speak to our organization when, when that was occurring. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, another question here, uh, would MCRSA uh, regulate the location of use? Um, from what I understand, there's gonna be some state regulations coming down on, on, uh, uh, on public use and public, you know, like a, uh, in, a, in a bar of some sort or some type of, uh, um, like a vapor room or something. Uh, from what we understand, those those are still coming down from the state, and that'll all kind of trickle down to the to the local level. And they're already, you know, banning it the same way as alcohol and others. That you know, so far from a park, a school, things of that sort, you, uh, public buildings. On a, they've already dealt with those regulations. This is more of where can you do it and where should you do it and things of that sort. And that'll dovetail into your local land use ordinances and tables are all these regulations going to make the product more expensive than the illegal product our problem will remain uh, our problem will remain uh, dealing with the illegal um, yeah this I mean this is something that we talked about you know if you make the market so uh, prohibitive from getting into by building a regulatory system that's costly uh, complicated you know, you're going to end up with a handful of folks that are just going to say, to heck with it, I'm going to keep 
you know, doing things the way I've been doing things for the last, you know, two decades or longer, uh, there is a robust uh, illegal infra uh, infrastructure market. You know, people have been selling weed for a long, long time in California. It's been illegal all the way up until, you know, now. So we, we have, you know, through these debates, had this discussion, you know, are we going too far? Is this too much? Um, or are we making it too easy? You know, are there, it's going to have to be a balance. Uh, I'll tell you, just in general and developing policy, it's always better to start with a stronger, more robust system and then scale it back. It's just politically policy way, you know, means it's, it's easier to do that. That's generally what most groups uh, would advocate for if you're engaged in any of this. It's the way we do things. We always want to start bigger and then scale it back. It's easier uh, to tell people, hey, you don't have to do this anymore instead of asking them to do more once it's up and running. But it's, it's something that we're going to have to see and it's going to take a, uh, some time and a lot of collection of data to really understand uh, you know, where do we find that, that perfect point on the taxes and on the regulations. How much population does 122,000 square foot grow cultivation uh, serve? Trying to figure out how much square footage you allow to serve a 200,000 population. <laughs> Same quite type of questions for testing, manufacturing, and dispensing. Interesting. Uh, very interesting question. So um, kind of just looking across the state at, at, at the way some other jurisdictions are tackling this, um, for storefronts, for an example, they're doing it by population. So they're saying, uh, like the city of Oakland originally was one per 100,000. So I think they're about a 410,000 uh, uh, population there. So they had four dispensaries, one per 100,000. They then uh, expanded that and made eight. And so they said one for every 50,000. Um, so that's a, that's a kind of good barometer or a good way for, for you as regulators and, and uh, planners uh, to kind of approach the, the retail dispensary piece of it. Um, the, the cultivation size, um, how much does that serve? That's a little bit nebulous as well because um, the different products that you make uh, require different aspects of the plant. Um, and, and the yields like for, for processing, uh, um, for oils and, and making edibles and things like that, the, um, uh, the yield is a lot smaller. Like for example, if I had a, a pound of flour and I, I processed that and I wanted to make uh, you know, vapor pens that had oil in it, you're gonna get probably about a sixteenth of that pound, would, it would translate into, into, into product as an example. So it's a little bit different depending on your product mix, uh, depending if you're serving just pure flours. Um, just, just to give you an example, um, for large-scale commercial cultivation for a graded pound, which means a pound that's not, there's no shake, it's, it's ready for market, um, that's a graded pound that a dispensary buys, um, that's got 128 eighths in it. And an eighth is typically about, you know, what somebody smokes in a week or a couple uh, eighths in a week, as an example. So. It's a little bit. It's a little bit of a loaded question in a sense because it's it's very very broad. But uh, that's and just... keep in mind, you're going to have people from other cities and counties coming in to yours if you have a dispensary, or there's they're going to come in and be shopping at that store. So it wouldn't be just for your community. But it's a very good. That's why we both said it's a very good question. It's it's tough to try and say here's the size of our community. So here's what we're allowing. The dispensary side, you can do it, like you said, Oakland's done. But on the actual cultivation side, it's it's a difficult. It depends on what they're cultivating. And here's something else to think about. I mean, for, I mean like like, like Temecula has a, a very good reputation for wineries and for for making wine. So what if Temecula became a, a destination for Temecula cannabis, right? It, it becomes your own branded product. So you may have an influx of people coming here to try that because of your microclimate, because of of you know the way that the city has has uh, approached this. Um, so that, that's the other side of the coin, right? You could, you could embrace this wholeheartedly and, uh, and have your own brand of uh, weed. Temecula, Temecula tush, Temecula tush. Um, <laughs> well, the, uh, yeah. <laughs> 
Consensus, no. <laughs> Will the agriculture commissioner uh, be required to certify each cannabis facility and post a sign with the rating? I don't know. Those are the regs. I mean, um, they're coming up with their own regs. Each licensing agency is coming up with their own regs in order for you to get a license. So they will have signage issues. All now, keeping in mind, a lot of them don't want signs. It it invites crime potentially. Uh, you may not even want to advertise that you're allowing grows because so it's completely the signage issue. And so so each agency licensing agency will have their own regulations as to all of that uh, labeling, uh, licensing or so signage, the whole bit. Um, but you guys also can do that. You can also say, no, we don't want any signs. Our ordinance says no signs on an indoor building, indoor grow building. We want it just to be in the middle of the manufacturing sec section of our city. No one will know what's in there, and it's going to be, you know, that's the way we want it. So, you know, it, it, each licensing agency is going to come up with their own rules. Any more questions from anybody? I have one more. Oh. Cross-checking of the city and county votes that were in favor of cannabis. Was any cross-checking done to see like where that city or county who did approve it ranked on crime, unemployment, school performance, education levels, um, property values, et cetera? Very good question. I don't believe so. Anybody? Any experts here? I don't I don't believe that that Mike. Excellent. All right, that's the questions. Uh, I want Amir to, to close on a couple of things. Can we get the uh, slides back up, please? And this is just about you guys, about your alignment, local options. So yeah, just to, just to kind of give you a just a, a final brief on on kind of where we're at on things. Uh, you know, the MMRSA or the MCRSA and Prop 64 were both written at different times, um, and they both had different goals. Um, in June uh, this year, Governor Brown signed uh, Senate Bill 94, uh, which was the Mercursa Act, and that basically aligned uh, the MCRSA and Prop 64 uh, for fiscal and bureaucratic reasons um, and regulatory reasons. Um, and then Assembly Bill 133 uh, was the first of many pop-up bills, uh, and that was used to amend the Mercursa statutes. Uh, and there's a ton of bills uh, constantly uh, in the legislature regarding this issue. Um, so let's talk about some local options, uh, regulating, taxing, or banning. <clears throat> so for personal cultivation, you guys have a choice. Uh, you know, you have the indoor option. I think it's probably the safest in a community like this. Um, again, you want to focus on canopy size. You want to focus on plant limits. Um, you know, maybe some type of registration process. Um, I think these are all very important things uh, in ensuring that the, the patients are served and, and they, they are able to uh, exercise their, their rights. Um, commercial cultivation, uh, probably outdoor, just pure outdoor in itself is probably a little unlikely out here. Um, I'd say probably a mixed light uh, operation probably be most effective or indoor. Um, dispensaries and retail sales, I mean, you guys already have that going on here. Um, it really just depends on how, how and where you want it. Uh, other license type or uh, other uh, license types. Um, so you're talking about manufacturing. You're talking about uh, uh, commercial testing. zones, testing, uh, large scale cultivation. You know these in, in Sacramento. These are reserved for the industrial and light industrial zones and manufacturing zones. Um, if it goes into a C zone, a general commercial zone, it has a, a much higher level of scrutiny um, because those are a lot more visible, you know, uh, uh, locations. Uh, zoning is the key. Um, the way you handle personal uh, cultivation, commercial cultivation, commercial production, commercial manufacturing, uh, retail sales, it all comes down to your local ordinance. Again, that's the driving hammer today is, is local, local, local. You know what's best for your community. You know where these things should or should not be. And, uh, you know, really, really look to your land use tables uh, because in, in a way you can limit your numbers based on how much 
land you have and, and, and what your zones are, what zones are available. You know, that's, that's a, really good way, a really good way to kind of to keep a lid on, on the activity that's happening. These are just some examples of some, some other taxes that are happening out there. Um, Oakland voters approve a 5% tax um, and then 10%, 5% uh, on medical and a 10% tax on non-medical activities. Uh, so that's a supplemental sales tax. So in addition to paying the you know 8.2% or 7.5%, whatever the, the state tax is, there's an additional uh, tax on the actual point of sale um, that happens. Um, you also have things like canopy tax. And when I remember when we were talking about canopy earlier, we we're talking about the actual square footage that's being used to flower. Um, they're actually assigning uh, dollar amounts that are based on an annual fee to those canopy sizes. So good example is uh, like in Humboldt or, or Lake County, they're doing a dollar for outdoor, two dollar for mixed light, and three dollar for indoor per, per, per square foot of canopy. Um, again, these are just, just some, uh, some examples of what's happening uh, across the board. And then just uh, moving forward, um, you know, serve the, the, your, the patients in the city ha have a right, you know, to, to access. Again, just be smart about how you're doing that. Um, again, you know, you know the best way to do it in your community. Um, contentious issues, uh, you know, ballot placement, tax measures. Uh, you, you have medical and non-medical that's going to kind of be coming into the picture here. So you guys really need to make decisions on, on if you're going to allow for both, if you're going to allow for one or the other. Um, you know, if, if uh, you know, the commercial regulations, uh, you know, cultivation, manufacturing, you need to decide if, if you guys do want to go down that path. Are we going to just go with up to a 5,000 square foot canopy? Are we going to do a 10,000? Are we going to do the 22,000s? Are we going to do some kind of mix of that? Are we just going to allow for testing? Are we just going to allow for manufacturing? Moral of the story is, is that you have all of these options at your disposal. You can say where you want to put these. You can say how you want to tax these. You can say how you want to regulate them. And that's it. Yes, sir. Question. How, do you want to do microphone? Where'd Randy go? I can talk loud. All right. Um, in cities and right there. Counties, Thank you. In cities and counties. Yeah. In cities and counties in like Colorado, do we have data that um, the cities and counties that have banned marijuana has their uh, uh, police costs went up trying to mitigate that? I mean, trying to keep them out. Has it actually increased because in the state and soon to be in California? It's, quote, legal, and so everybody just assumes they can do all this stuff. So will it, will it put an undue burden on our police force constantly, you know, basically enforcing the fact that we have a ban in place and you can't do this? Have, is there data that shows anything like that, that incre increased cost? In the, the data that I've seen has been statewide. And okay. uh, talking to the folks that... Regardless of whether you allow it or not, you're seeing impacts. So, you know, we've talked to law enforcement officers out there. We've talked to their police chiefs association, and, and it's each jurisdiction is, is feeling impacts. I mean, it's different, you know, for a variety of reasons. You can't control for every factor that's, you know, related to DUI or, or youth access and use or uh, hospitalization, but the impacts are statewide. And, and by that, I, I mean in, in all regions regardless of what, what it is. So you will see an impact to your law enforcement agencies here. Uh, no one can tell how big it's gonna be, but you, would, you should anticipate that there is going to be one. You uh, talked before about uh, when it gets to us, we're already looking at a 25% tax. Uh, and then I thought I heard you say that the state is not taxing medical. Did I hear that correctly? Yeah, correct. So Sales tax. Sales tax, okay. So if we subtract, let's say that's 8%, whatever it is. So uh, medical would be coming to us then with 17%. Is that correct? Medical, yes, yes that's correct. So. Okay. I, I, I don't think so. I think it's lower, I don't it? think. Yeah, I, I think uh, recreational is going to have the higher tax. Uh, I think it's 15% uh, 
on top of the of the already state tax right. plus any local tax. That's just a, a separate fee. Um, but for medical, um, you're going to get an exemption basically of the of the excise tax, if you will. Um, but you have to go through a registry and, and sign up as a medical patient. Okay, but can we figure out? I mean, looking at it from from our point of view as the city of Temecula. Um, we may want to, and I'm not speaking for my colleagues here, but we may want to allow medical, but not adult use. So if we did that, where is, where's our, right. uh, our, our limit, let's say, as we talked about where you want to go and not encourage the black market, how far could we go in order to know that we have to know what it's coming to us, as, as what the tax rate is from the state, for medical, so I don't think we've determined that. So, you know, Board of Equalization Chair Fiona Ma is here, and she's going to be on the panel right after lunch. So she probably will have those absolute answers for you on the taxation levels and what's where it's going. But Great. just just as an example, uh, like the City of Sacramento for medical, they have their already when you when you purchase at a dispensary. Um, you pay your sales tax, but then there's the supplemental sales tax. We're seeing anywhere from three to five percent supplemental sales tax on medical, and that kind of keeps it right in line of about you know twelve to thirteen percent tax. I had a question. Um, so I'm hearing about all this regulation, and it seems like magically on January first that we are going to be able to regulate and get rid of all of those who are not following the law at this point. And I just don't know how that's going to happen. Why would the black market that's been operating in our city since day one, they obviously care nothing about regulation, why would they just pack up and go home? And then the second part to that question is, we can barely afford our law enforcement coverage as it is, how are we going to pay for extra law enforcement coverage? Because I think it's a pretty common assumption that we will need that. Uh, so I, I just have those two. We've, we've been battling this in our city since day one, and we're one of the new cities in Riverside County. So it is a uh, very what city serious, are you with? serious issue. Harupa Valley. So, so do, you, do you have a, an ordinance in place? Yes. It's not legal it's a, in our city. You, you it have hasn't a been. We adopted the county ordinance when we became a city, and we kept it in place. And then we've complied with the six plants, you know, for the medical mm -hmm. use, indoor grow, those kinds of things. But so, the rest so, is so that open. magic deadline basically is. Let, let's say you have five rogue dispensaries in your in your county within your county. Twelve. Limits. Twelve. <laughs> uh, so, so those, those twelve, if if they're operating past January first, again, you may lack the local resources to really go after them and force. Uh, you know, I mean, there's a lot of ways to go after them. You know, typically the property owner start living his yes. property, and that's and we do all yeah, of that. that. That's typically the the way to go. Um, but come January first, if if they're operating um, and not not having a state license, those those penalties that we showed and, and talked about, those all come into effect. Yeah, but your concern is who, if we can't enforce it, that? how much now? How are we going to enforce it yeah. in January? Right. So is there like a state level organization that's no, going to help with that? One thing or? we fought for, but we were kind of joking about this morning. One thing we fought for were to have some grant programs for cities who want to enhance their law enforcement presence. But the amount of money that ended up getting in there is going to end up like... Yeah, so... Well, my, my understanding is if you aren't legalizing it, you won't be eligible yeah, to apply correct. for those yep. grant funding. You, won't, you won't be eligible, and then also that grant funding is going to be... Small. Small. So it's it will come out as a formula. That's what we're hearing from BSEC, so it's not going to be... You're not going to have to apply and write a grant proposal. It's going to come out based on a formula they develop, and we'll be working with BSEC to ensure, you know, with the League of Cities that that's an equitable formula, uh, you know, just like a lot of the cities, uh, our association gets annoyed with like LA taking all the money and everyone else gets the crumbs. So we, we will fight to make sure that it's, it's more equitable. Um, you know, LA is still going to get all the money <laughs> regardless, it just happens. Uh, but you know, that, that will be something that we'll work towards. And I will say, as we talk to folks in Colorado, I, I, this last week when we were out there, I met with the uh, former head of the enforcement division there. And they said, it, it actually, as the system got up and running, people actually 
would rather go to a store than go to a drug dealer's house. You know, so it, 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 there's a natural kind of move towards the actual legal market. It's easier. Um, you know, you don't have to hang out with a drug dealer. Uh, <laughs> some benefits like that. Um, an illegal drug dealer. An illegal, yeah. Uh, uh, so, oh, so, yeah. But yeah, it's, it will be challenging. No doubt about it. What, just also, so it's a two-part answer. There's no current funding that we know of for a city who is banning it to go out and get extra dollars. However, keep in mind, I just showed you the list of all the new law enforcement folks from all the different agencies who will be helping and assisting local law enforcement. So my recommendation, if, if your her example, is that uh, as you see after January 1st, you, earmark, or you, you, you uh, target your dispensaries or illegal grows, that you go to that licensing agency and you file a complaint with them and ask them to come down and assist your local law enforcement to try and shut it down. Yeah, and, and last I will say there is a, a bill that's pending before the legislature for next year. Assembly member Tom Lackey from Palmdale introduced it. Uh, it's just the bare bones structure right now of something that, that we want to try and work on. It's a way to uh, organize law enforcement uh, and, and make consistent, consistent enforcement activities from law enforcement for the state. It's going to put CHP as kind of the umbrella organization to help organize the resources throughout the state and ensure that you know we have uh, what you know what we need to go after the really really hot spots. So that's something that we will be working for. If it's a task force model that combines you know state level law enforcement with local jurisdictions, I mean that might be something. There might be funding attached to it as well, but we'll see. Yeah, I have a question. Um, I'm listening to the discussion about the taxation and the sensitive balance between uh, uh, incentivizing the black market and where's that sweet spot on, um, on, on the price tag that the local jurisdiction wants to impose. And I couldn't help but think, and this may be a, a foolish question, but I don't know. On the medicinal side of the house, um, if you've been given a prescription for a card for medicinal marijuana purchases, um, has the insurance industry got into this? Therefore, do they help pay for that patient's drug, in a sense? And if so, um, I could see that um, negating or uh, the cost or a factor in what the tax would be locally. So I don't know. I don't know if insurance covers uh, medicinal patients. So health plans drug. right now, for the most part, and tell me if I'm wrong, but what I've looked at, health plans don't cover your prescription, cannabis prescriptions. If the feds change some of that, although they don't need to, I mean, it's a prescription, just like, you know, but if it's, it's a Schedule One drug, um, until the federal government makes some changes there, I mean, you're, I don't, you're not going to see, you're not going to see insurance companies jumping on board and helping fund fund their prescriptions. And just to clarify, uh, if you get a doctor's, what they call a script, it's really just a recommendation. It's not a prescription. It's just a recommendation. <coughs> All right. Well, no more questions. Oh, I'm sorry. I have one question. Okay. You, you read off some statistics about the trend in Colorado in terms of some of the negative uh, trends that occurred afterwards. How many years does it take before that kind of data is available to to actually see how things are affecting a community? And is the state looking at putting any sort of a database in place right from day one where us jurisdictions could be feeding you the information so that after a year's time, we can see if, if we adopted any of these regulations, is it going in a good direction or a negative direction so that we can at least be advising our policymakers on the fly so that they have real-time information if this has been good or bad? Yeah, there's no, there's no like a legally, legally set up database other than the database that I talked to you about um, in terms of trends and the like. However, what we will be talking about with Fiona Ma is one of the recommendations that came out of the banking working group that was created by the current state treasurer and of which Ms. Ma sits on. One of their recommendations was to get local governments to work with states, to, to, with our state and to get the local agencies to uh, start a database to 
provide all that type of information on what's happening, taxation issues, uh, crime issues, all of that. So there is, that is the recommendation from this working group that just came out, yeah, was it yesterday or the day before yesterday, from the treasurer's office. So I think that's a very important issue. We are going to try, just my organization alone, we are gonna to try to start doing some type of tracking on cannabis to see if we can see any trends. But as you know, any, any database is only as good as what goes into it, right? So, I mean, we would have to have the cooperation of everyone to, in order to get a, we can do a little regional uh, test. We can do, you know, city by county by city. But until we get the data from all of you, a database won't work. But the, I, I, and I do, and in my final piece, I do believe each of the agencies will be gathering information as well. And they're gonna be reporting back to the legislature periodically with their reports of their data. I just don't know what the report will, will specify. I, yeah. I, I haven't seen them yeah. yet. I'll yeah. say we're, we're already way behind on collecting data. That's Listen to your conversation. I'm from the city of Indio, and we don't allow anything. We're essentially free. We don't have anything, deliver anything, and we've, we've actually uh, put an ordinance in place to stop it. But all around us, we have cities that do have it. And as you said, it's being pushed over into our area because right. of we have available warehouse space, we have available uh, retail space in areas, and also commercial space, which is affecting us. And other things, like we have our concerts, the Coachella Fest and Stagecoach, when we had to go out and put that out there, we had to get a CEQA exemption, we had to call all the other cities around us because <laughs> it was a major impact on everybody else. How is this not a major impact on the rest of us that do not have the jurisdiction or do not want marijuana in us, but we're being forced on it because of other areas around us, but they're collecting a tax on it. Where is the quality? It's kind of like it's forcing you to either join up and do it to get some of that funding, which you say is minimal, or fight it yourself with your own public safety, which is being stretched thin from the sheriff all the way down to the others. How do you get some equalization on other agencies or other cities or counties around you that are now having an impact on your city, which is stretching your budget? And you know, I don't see the, the equality behind this. You know, well, definitely impacts. We we are seeing that, and you're obviously you're seeing that as well. There are, actually there are some positive impacts too. I mean, I know in the city of Sacramento, their um, man, uh, their industrial their industrial rates, industrial building rates, lease rates, <laughs> started when we first looked at them, they were about some 29 cents a square foot or some crazy. And right now they're going for upwards of $3 a square foot. The Black Rock Investment Company, or whatever they're called, they're one of the largest in the world, came in just within the last couple of weeks and spent $450 million on industrial space in the city of Sacramento. On 88 buildings. 88 buildings they bought. So, they're, so, that, so now the county is seeing that their, their values are going up and all of like, so anyway, there's that impact. I just, you made me think of it when you were asking your question, that there's that impact as well. But you're right, there's a negative impact potentially because of what you're seeing, we called it the, the island effect. Um, you know, I don't know, it's like the big box stuff. Like someone mentioned, Mike, I think Mike mentioned earlier about, you know, they, you're gonna not allow the big box, they're gonna go next door and that's where the tax revenue is gonna go. Are all of your folks now leaving and not shopping in your area and going there? So you always have those impacts. I don't know the answer. There's no legislation to say that they have to go and check out the impacts on you before they allow a grow in their city. If that's what you're asking, there's no there's no statute mandating that. On your three dollar tax, three dollar tax per square foot, <clears throat> you couldn't help them from down to take over and grow it somewhere. Oh, and your buildings no longer have value to them, and everything goes down because it's been pushed out. So it has a good effect in the minimum part, but in the long run, we've seen that in multiple businesses when the economy goes down. Those, those offices and those commercial buildings become empty and become eyesores now as the system sits. So it's a temporary rise and long-term issue. Yeah. I want to put this in a larger context. Uh, many of our cities are having all kinds of difficulties without having this thrown at us too and mm -hmm. adding to our police costs and, and, and whatever. Uh, but it seems like historically the country went through this in prohibition you know, tried to outlaw alcohol. Uh, it seems like the uh, big cigarette makers have prevented us from really dealing with cigarettes. 
uh, which probably caused more deaths than uh, alcohol or, or marijuana. Uh, I'm trying to understand if the people voted you know, to allow both medical and recreational, it seems so onerous, and you said it would start difficulty and then they'd you know, peel it back or whatever, but it seems like we're going through an awful lot of effort to deal with something which may be minor when compared to alcohol or minor when compared to cigarettes or whatever, and historically, uh, governments have had problem regulating and keeping away black markets. Yeah, that's a statement, right? <laughs> that's not a question. Yeah, because <laughs> I, I agree. I agree. Yep. Okay, so we're going to go break for lunch. Um, we're going to go right out into this area here. There are box lunches. I want to thank CRNR for sponsoring the lunch. You're wonderful people because I'm really hungry, and I appreciate that. And they work with you on a lot of stuff anyway. When we get back, we'll have one hour left, and we will do banking. I just want to let you know that there's a lot happening right now in the banking area, and it is probably, pardon? Oh, lunch is only a half hour? Okay, so we'll be back here at 12.30, I guess. Um, anyway, there's a lot going on in the banking area that you guys wanna know, because keep in mind, it's not just about banking, it's what do you do with your local taxes, how do you collect it, and the like, thanks. Okay, I think we're going to get going here if everyone wants to find their seats. Okay. So the plan is we're going to talk about banking, go through some of the uh, issues relating to both the federal, state, and how it relates to you if you're collecting any revenues or whether they be taxes or fees, what to do with that money since banking is, can a, can a banking is what we call it. If can a banking isn't uh, legal yet, what do you do with the money? And the, the dangerousness, I guess, of the all-cash business it is today. Um, I'd like to introduce Fiona Ma. The, I don't know, we have, we have a slide with her bio, but I can just tell you. She was the recent past chair. She's still on the Board of Equalization. She was recently the chair and is, like I stated earlier, currently running for the State Insurance Commissioner. I mean, I'm <laughs> state, state Treasurer and uh, is unopposed, which I hope, anyway. Um, so uh, we've been working together. Fiona was on the San Francisco Board of Supervisors, then was elected to the California State Assembly. I really got to know her. She sat on the Assembly Public Safety Committee and actually what be, was showed from San Francisco was law enforcement's uh, one of her, the biggest supporters. And it was incredible that she, she immediately, as a fresh freshman assembly member, stood up for some very controversial issues that law enforcement was going through and said, I'm sorry, but this is what I believe in and the press is gonna hit me, I don't care. And that's the kind of person she's been from day one. Um, on the Board of Equalization, one of her uh, issues has been cannabis. She's been involved in the cannabis uh, issue since day one from her election. And she also sits on the banking, the treasurer put together a banking working group. You've heard us talk about that. We have some slides on it. Uh, treasurer John Chung came out with some recommendations from that group and also his own from his agency himself. Those will also, we'll discuss uh, those recommendations. They came out two days ago. So this will be the first time anybody's even hearing about them. So with that, uh, I'll let Fiona start. What we'd like to do is we'll do our banking piece. Have any questions you have, I already have one here. And then what we'd like to do for the remainder of the time is we just wanna open it up. We want you guys to ask us questions, talk to, I'd like to know when we get to that point, I wanna find out how many cities or counties are here who have, are you all, do you have a ban? What, what's your current situation on cannabis? And any questions about anything we talked about today? I wanna open it up. All the consultants are still here. 
So I think it would be a perfect timing. So anyway, with that, Fiona Ma. Thank you, thank you, Randy. Hello, okay. Uh, so um, Randy explained that I am from San Francisco, but originally born and raised in New York. Uh, I am a CPA, a tax accountant by training. I forgot that part. That's okay. Uh, decided to leave uh, one of the big eight accounting firms when I was 28 years old to start my own practice. And that's when I started getting involved in uh, public services, really advocating for small businesses. So I come to government, you know, with that private sector, understanding taxes and loopholes and finances, uh, and then bringing it to, you know, having to wear my government hat. So when it comes to uh, this topic, cannabis, um, as many of you probably know, the medicinal cannabis industry started in San Francisco because we had a large AIDS uh, crisis uh, many decades ago, and cannabis was the uh, medicinal solution uh, for many. Um, we never argue about cannabis. Uh, we. Uh, only talk about in San Francisco whether it is accessible, whether it is affordable, um, and how uh, to protect the industry. Uh, so I don't know where, what cities you all are from, but I uh, come from a very liberal um, perspective uh, in San Francisco. And then when uh, I got elected to the State Assembly in 2006 to 2012 at the height of the Great Recession, uh, we also never talked about cannabis. It wasn't one of those uh, topics of the day. Uh, and then I got elected to the Board of Equalization in 2014, and I found out that the board is supposed to be collecting sales taxes from dispensaries. And I thought, like other medical products, that it wouldn't be taxable. Uh, and because of this conundrum of the federal state, uh, we only started collecting taxes about 10 years ago in 2006. Uh, and so we are uh, kind of behind in terms of the tax collection. I estimate only maybe 25% of the dispensaries are actually uh, taking out a seller's permit and paying taxes. But with the wake of Prop 64, I think everybody is going to uh, be taking out their seller's permits, trying to figure out uh, how to pay their taxes, especially if they want to get a local and a state license. Um, so I. Uh, have been working on this issue in terms of how can we get more people to pay their taxes. And then I found out that uh, the cash uh, conundrum is, is a big problem uh, in communities and putting on my public safety hat, you know, how do we make communities safer? And then putting on my CPA hat, you know, how do we create a paper trail so that we can actually audit? Uh, and collect the taxes due. And so that led me uh, to the big elephant in the room, which is banking. Uh, the fact that it is still a Schedule I uh, controlled substance and therefore uh, does not have easy access to banking. And in a time when we all depend on credit cards, electronic fund transfers, uh, all of you know the modern conveniences we have, uh, an eight to twenty billion dollar industry that uh, mostly does business in cash. So this is where we have. Uh, uh, I've been focusing my efforts in the last three years. Uh, I sat on Treasurer John Chung's uh, banking stakeholder meeting. There were sixteen of us, I believe, and we had six meetings uh, uh, across the state. We heard uh, over fifty panelists come and talk about. Uh, their ideas or uh, best practices in other states. And so we are going to talk a little bit about our findings and recommendations in that report and then kind of where we go from here. So, Randy. Well, there, there's the group there. So going back, going back, uh, there are several problems. We've talked about, I think, most of them today, and that's obviously, like Fiona said, the Schedule One drug. Uh, on the banking side, there have been several studies within the banking industry about how can we get into this. I mean, obviously banks generally are there to make money. Even if they're a, a, a credit union or something like that where they have members, their idea is not to lose money, right? Well, they have done lots of work in what the potential revenues are in the cannabis world. And they want to bank. Uh, the, the governor's director of all the banks in California is the, the, the 
the commissioner of the uh, Department of Business Oversight for California, oversees all the banks. They, she has been working on behalf of the, the governor and with all of the banks. And she called, recently called a meeting of the banks who may be interested in the cannabis industry. And every top bank showed up. Citibank, Wells, you name it. They were all there. 13 banks showed up. She only invited 10. 13 showed up, and she had to turn away several uh, of the groups. So she did allow associations to represent all the credit unions and like to show. But it was overwhelming. The banking industry wants in. They see it. The problem is they have to get federal insurance. Federal insurance is given by the FDIC, as you know. For the most part, there is one private insurer out there, but for the most part, they have to have the federal insurance. The only way you get that is you have a direct bank account with the feds, and to do ACHs and things of that, it's all a federal program. So even if they were clearly could set up what we call their own back rails, where how they transfer from one bank to another and the like, or have an ATM system and all that, the ATM system is on a national system. Anything that crosses the lines in California, the, the, our boundaries, anything that goes to another state, it, it becomes federal. So they have done numerous studies, and Colorado Bankers Association actually did the best study I've seen so far. They actually talked about all the rules, the federal guidelines, um, and I'll go into those in a minute, and so will Fiona and the Cole Memo and the like. But they came back and literally said, what I said this morning, until there's a literal act of Congress to, to allow, to do either allow or, or change the schedule of banking or put language in the appropriations bill that allows for banks to bank cannabis money. And just so you know, last year in the 26th Senate appropriations bill, they had language. Whereas it's dangerous to society, whereas the all cash business is you know, not the way we should, whereas it's driving people underground. We're on and on all the bad things of, of uh, not, be, not being able to bank this industry. Therefore, we're going to allow states who have regulated medical cannabis and are doing business in medical cannabis to allow banking. The House pulled it out of the bill. I mean, you saw the banking industry, man. They were at the hearings. They were like, we are ready to roll in California, baby and the House pulled it out. And so there's a lot of talk about, well, the 2018 elections for that industry is going to be very big because if the Dems take back the House, maybe in the 2019 uh, uh, House, the newly elected House, in the appropriations bill, maybe there will be something on banking. But again, it was limited, um, the whole bit. So that, those are some of the problems. FinCEN, that is an organization, those are the basically the financial crimes unit underneath the U.S. Treasurer's Office. And FinCEN is in charge of all the banking issues. Basically, they do the rigs to go after cartels and illegal trafficking and the like. They have come out with regulations. And FinCEN, well, actually, they're more like guidelines. What was that movie? Well, it's more like a guideline. Um, they came, out with, they came out with guidelines that for a bank saying, okay, if you're going to work within the cannabis industry, here are the things you need to do. And they went through all of the, the, the issues that they would have to see, all of the different audits and the like. Came up with the, this is the group that came up with the uh, KYC system, know your customer. It's a requirement. You must know your customer. If you know that customer and their money is coming from cannabis, you must stop having them or we will shut you down. There were uh, two years ago, three years ago when the study was done, at that point there had been 437 bank personnel who had been arrested because of working in cannabis. Um, so they're very, very scared of it. The bottom line from the, Col this is Colorado, Colorado Banker Association, they said, don't do it until the feds make the change that we're talking about. There's one credit union in Colorado that's operating right now. They're working with a financial network that's a, an internal financial network, I think it's out of Hawaii, and everybody's watching this credit union. This woman who owns it is like way out there. I mean, she is just out in front saying, bring it. 
to the feds. And so everybody's waiting for them to bring it. So we'll see what happens there. Um, the whole banking industry is watching that. But anyway, those are, those are the problems right now. Those are the issues that everybody's facing. Can I just add that um, in Colorado, uh, because their uh, government leadership team are all on the same page and basically Democrats, um, they want to bank the industry. There are banks that are banking the industry, wink, wink, uh, on a don't ask, don't tell basis. But Colorado is, you know, small, right? I think they generated 1.2 uh, billion in sales last year, 2016. 1.2. California is at least 10 times uh, that size of Colorado. But in Washington State, because Washington State uh, um, has a very onerous uh, cannabis licensing policy, very similar to the alcohol policy, where you pretty much have to, you know, give a background check, DOJ background check, you know, your tax returns, you know, <laughs> sign over, you know, your first child, um, they have five or six institutions that are banking the industry uh, publicly. Um, and that's because of their licensing. So that's one of the challenges that we have here in California is um, can we help the bankers know your customers uh, better, you know, do some of that due diligence for them so that they could apply uh, with the federal government uh, for uh, the permission to bank the industry. So there's about, I think, 200 plus banks across uh, the nation that has received approval to bank banking. Uh, we're hoping that California is also going to uh, be applying, but of course we're a lot larger, and Randy said they all want to make money, but they also don't want to assume any risks uh, of losing you know, their, um, their licenses. So that's why the California banks are really sitting and watching and have been waiting for the study, basically. Right. I know in Washington, you bring up Washington, but Washington right now there's a pilot project going on with a private company who created a, just an intrastate system, and they're working with one credit union. It's a pilot project. So we're all watching that very closely. There's a small industry that's being created on this also. We talk about the Know Your Customer. There's a, a, an industry, that, a cottage industry that's being created now where they're going in and vetting cannabis companies, dispensary owners, growers. They're vetting them completely for banks. So banks are signing up with these companies to vet their cannabis folks so they qualify under the KYC programs for the, under FinCEN. So we're moving, we're inching, inching. I'll, one political comment. People were ready to roll on this because they knew that Hillary was gonna win. They were ready, baby. They were like, okay, Hillary's coming in. Now Hillary wasn't real big, you know, pro-cannabis. However, people who spoke in the industry who spoke with her privately knew she knew it was a dangerous situation on the banking and the all cash business. She wanted to do something about that. So people were doing this. And as soon as Trump got elected, everybody kind of stood back a little bit. And then Jeff Sessions becomes the attorney general. And there are so many quotes from him as a senator saying, you know, marijuana is the scourge of life and on and on and on. And everybody was like, Oh my gosh, the, everything came to a complete halt. So, until so Jeff Sessions comes out, and I told you this morning, he uh, did you want something to say on yeah, that? Yeah, I was just going to say, um, you know, Hillary, I, I believe, was willing to uh, reschedule uh, from a Schedule One right. to a Schedule Two, but that doesn't necessarily mean that just because it's a Schedule Two uh, drug, it's going to be accessible and open. So it still needs an act of Congress. Um, or a presidential um, executive order uh, to open up the banking regardless. And of course, if Bernie got elected, he was gonna deschedule, so make it legal like alcohol, right? So that was like the extremes that we had on our side, and then now we have this. So the treasurer, John Chung, started the Cannabis Banking Working Group. And this group, as she said, uh, Fiona explained, it went up and down the state, held hearings on banking, and it was very well done. I mean, every, if you didn't attend it, everyone watched it on simulcast. It was, it was very well done. And they had experts from uh, all the other states. I know at one point, I think, I don't know if he spoke there or that earlier that day he spoke, but the governor of Colorado came and spoke. I mean, they did a very good job. And from that, the uh, John Chung, these are the 
he came out yesterday with some findings. Um, all cash business makes all persons at every level targets. These were findings they made. Um, state and local governments that take or take taxes and fee payments uh, from uh, on a from a cash industry uh, were incurring added expenses, demands on stuff, and risk to employee safety. I, I don't. I haven't talked with uh, Fiona about this, but we spoke with the CEO of the Board of Equalization, and we said, you know. Are you taking cannabis money? He says, well, yeah, it's taxes. It's a business. We're taking it. And we said, how do you do that? And he said, well, it's an interesting process. <laughs> he says, we have regional offices. And what we do is we set up times with these people who tell us ahead of time they're coming to pay their taxes in cash. And it'll be sometimes 7 o'clock at night. Then the next quarter they come in, they change it. Maybe it's 10 o'clock in the morning. But they set it up, and they, they have a, 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 a armored car will, will be there. At the, and he said, Randy, you don't believe it. They will bring in bags of cash that's shrink-wrapped. And we will have machines right there. And, brrr, ca and it, he said, they open a bag, and it reeks like marijuana. He said, but these are people trying to do it right. They're but they can't bank. So the only way they can pay their taxes. He says, we take it. But man, our staff are scared. They don't want to be a part of this. He goes, we're putting them at risk if they have to stay there till 7 at night and have some guy with 200,000 cash come in. I mean, and then there's other people that we happen to know, somebody the, who owns a dispensary, the largest dispensary in the country out of Oakland. And his partner straps it. He said he strapped $180,000 to his body and just wore big old, he actually wears dresses, and he wore big old moo moo. He wears big moo moos, and he had this moo moo on, and he goes to the BOE, and they walk in, they, hey, how you doing? He starts, on, he goes to the bathroom, comes out, and hands him straps of cash. I mean, it's ridiculous the amount of money. Small amounts, it's a different industry. Yeah. This is billions. How do you do that? Well, I think our largest. Um in San Francisco, uh, our largest uh, taxpayer brings in $400,000 in suitcases, and it takes six hours uh, to count, because you have to count it three times. Sometimes there's illegal bills. Sometimes there's you know crumpled bills. Um, so it is really, really time consuming on our end. Um, so um, the faster we can fix this problem, I think, the better for everybody. So you see there on the third rec finding that they found, they, they, it's dangerous. Basically, it's kind of almost along the same lines as the federal appropriations bill. Um, that it's, it's we've got to get these people out of the shadows and into being be, becoming a part of our taxpayers uh, group. So what they did, they, they had find the, both the committee and the treasurer had their own findings on the number one cash handling for collection of taxes. One of the issues the treasurer's make recommend, uh, made a recommendation is the state, the treasurer's office, but along with other agencies and pair, uh, want to pair up with local governments, want to provide a state-run uh, armored car system, a courier system, where banks may not have to handle this, you guys don't want to have to handle this, so you have somebody coming in paying with cash. And by the way, these recommendations go from where we are today where there's very little banking, if any, so it's pretty much all cash, to when the feds finally make a change. And then what are the recommendations in all the way in between there? Because I think it, with, with the Senate Appropriations Committee's actions and language last week, we think it's going to happen. Because it's just too dangerous and it's too big now. 29 states have medical and or uh, adult use right now and the District of Columbia. So more, over half our states are already going that way and more are going to go in 2018. So I think the feds are seeing that it's too dangerous and too large of an industry to allow it to continue in cash. Um, so they want to be able to, that, that armored car system, they come to your city, they come to whoever's handling your money, you call them ahead of time, they're there, the people bring it, you count it, they take it right out of your hands right there. And they take it either to Federal Reserve or to a banking institution that, that is going to agree. They've talked, uh, so that is an immediate thing they're talking about trying to set up. So they're doing studies on this right, right as we speak. Can I just jump in? Um, local governments and state governments, we are able to take their tax payments uh, from the industry because we consider it commingled funds. We don't just say, 
only cannabis can pay us in cash. A lot of people pay in cash for one reason or another, but we are able to commingle the funds, therefore take the money and then go and deposit it. In our case, um, San, um, California, we bank with uh, Bank of America. So we take the money and then we walk it across to Bank of America. Um, we do have pilot programs where our uh, employees are actually at the bank. So therefore, they don't have to come to our offices. They can just go in the bank, and they can record the person coming in, how much they've taken, and then deposit right there. I mean, that ultimately, you will all uh, be facing that same uh, issue is, you know, do you want all of your agencies, people coming in with cash? And you, you, some of you are going to be like, we are not prepared to take this much cash. Our employees don't want to take this cash. Like, what are we going to be doing? You know, so I think we're all trying to figure out uh, some solution at the federal, uh, at the state and the local level to be able to uh, better uh, manage our cash and handle it and hopefully get it to the bank directly. The second finding uh, dealt with expanding kind of the industry's actual access. So this is like the next step, actually trying to get them access. And one of the findings from the treasurer was to see if they can set up a, a database, a portal, wherein local governments and state agencies could all contribute to this portal. Um, just data sharing. And that's something, it was funny, that's something we talked about during lunch. We talked about, and, and Matt, came up and said, why aren't we data sharing everything related to cannabis? Why aren't we setting something up like that? Well, this is a recommendation on the banking piece, but our recommendation would be we, ex we expand this portal to include all the things we talked about earlier, crime statistics, things of that sort. But this portal is strictly for cannabis banking, and that would be you guys share everything so you know what the latest laws are. What, what's happening in northern part of the town where, or north part of the state where a bank was just shut down? Or FinCEN has put out new regs. It immediately goes to this portal. All your financial people in your cities and counties immediately have access to that information. And then the uh, third issue finding was a state-backed financial institution. That's one of the questions we have here. Uh, are there any plans by the state to form a financial institution to handle cannabis-related issues? Yes, they're looking into it. Okay, so um, you may hear a lot from your constituents that they want a public bank. Uh, why can't we have a public bank, right? Um, as you know, creating any sort of new entity within government, uh, number one, has a cost. Uh, number two, it would have to go through both houses in the legislature. Uh, the Assembly and the Senate, and they would have to go through the Banking Committee first. And we know who sits on the Banking Committees for those, uh, for those com committees, usually people who are supportive of the banks and the financial institutions. Uh, so that is a bigger, um, you know, a, a bigger project. I mean, I would love to have a public bank where California uh, is the banker. We don't have to charge exorbitant fees. We could give out loans. Anybody, you know, who doesn't have good credit could mm -hmm. open up a bank account. I mean, that would be the ultimate, right? I think for all of us uh, in government and the public. But it's just a bigger hurdle. So there are other recommendations in the report, like having a banker's bank. Uh, where there'd be uh, an in, uh, entity that would help do all of the vetting, like Randy said, to know your customer, you know, compile all the records, make sure uh, the folks who are applying uh, for a bank account are legitimately in the cannabis business and not gun runners or human traffickers, right? That's the whole uh, crux of this, and the cash business is, you know, who is doing business? and the banks right now and the credit unions don't have the, uh, the, the capability to go and do all the due diligence and do all the checks. But we all know this is a technological age. Uh, it's very hard for people uh, to get away uh, for very long with all of the different law enforcement and public uh, access information out there. So um, I actually think that the banker's bank idea is a lot more feasible um, idea and, and probably quicker to implement. The Bankers Bank actually helps in two other ways as well. One is, one of the problems banks have is they are limited on how much revenue they can bring in from any one industry. Uh, for example, they don't want a, an, an agricultural bank you know, having all of their assets in corn or something. I mean, it's just dangerous. The corn market goes, boom, everybody, there's a run on that bank. 
So they're limited. I think it's 20% of any one type of industry that they can bring income in. So a banker's bank would allow them to spread out that, spread out where the money, they would collect the money because maybe I'm a grower and that Wells Fargo is my bank. But Wells Fargo would immediately move that to the bank, banker's bank. They would move it to the central bank. So it wouldn't be on their books under the 20% rule. Secondly, keep in mind, where banks make money isn't just holding on to your money and you paying them you know, your $9 fee a month. Where they make their money is they take your money and they reinvest it. Well, if a bank can't spend cannabis money in investments because they're federally run or they're in another state or they're investing in you know, some commodity overseas, you can't do that if the feds are still uh, you know, opposed or it's illegal, uh, cannabis is still illegal federally. You can't invest. Where do, what do you do with the money? So you bring in $3 billion. How do you invest it? Where do you put it? Now, some of it you can put back out on loans to the industry. You need to buy, you know, 5,000 new plants. Okay, we're going to loan you the money. You need a tractor for that new wheat field. We're going to loan you the money. But that's a very small piece. So that's another aspect where the bankers bank could take some of those revenues and they could put out loans as well to people on in other industries it doesn't have to be on cannabis so that's all the idea but it's there so the recommendation from the treasurer is we need a feasibility study because it could be billions of dollars to get this thing up and running and the banking industry would have to come in and say okay we're willing to do this because keep this in mind as much as the bank, the banking industry generally would oppose a central bank or a state-run bank, if it helps them get into the cannabis industry, they may want to look the other way a little bit. So that's kind of the feasibility study idea of the treasurer. Yep. Oh, I'm sorry, there was one more there. Um, the fourth issue is just full access. That's the federal solution we talked about. The treasurer's recommendation was, at this point, was to set up a multi-state consortium of of legislative representatives, congressional reps, uh, people from the industry to educate, um, to outreach to people in the industry, but also and mostly to outreach to Congress and to the administration about the dangers, the impacts, how much revenue we're losing out on, all the things that we've talked about. Get a consortium of all the, say, for example, Oregon, Washington, and California. They all have it legal right now, or it's going to be. So a consortium of that those states should be working on lobbying Congress to get these things changed, whether it's a... Unless ask, add Nevada. In add Nevada. Nevada. Yeah, right, right, right. Are they legal? Yeah. Oh, I didn't know Oh, that. yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah, no, we always leave out Nevada, so they're uh, a little they're sensitive. They're kind of the stepchildren. Um, so anyway, that's, that's the recommendation that they're going to look at doing is putting up that consortium, getting people involved. I assume you would be involved in that. Um, any, any issues or questions up to this point? Um, so does California allow state charter schools? Is it in our constitution? Yes. In California, the question is, does California allow state chartered banks? Yes, we do, and they are under the, De the Department of Business Oversight. They are chartered only in California. However, those, even though they're chartered in California, they still have... ATMs, they have ACH programs, they still cross the borders with other companies. Could you, couldn't you restrict it to intrastate only? Yes, you could. Yes, you and could. And then we but could maybe circumvent the, the, the big issue government. then becomes how do, where do they get their insurance? Because they're FDIC insured. There's, there, private there's one private insurer out of Arizona, and I believe and, he's and I agree in, that and one be, in Ohio. But Private insurance can be created, and there are right. uh, people in the industry who already have told us that they're willing to do that. So, yes, that is a possibility. Any other questions? I'm prone on statements and not questions. Uh, between jobs, I became fascinated by this whole cash thing. Uh, at one time, I had talked to Fiona in, in San Francisco. Um, First went down the credit union path and was looking to the industry itself to provide the seed money to do the credit union. Uh, the problem was one person, one investor, one vote. And so the investors, which were part of the industry, didn't want to get involved in something where they gave up control. Um, 
took a look then at uh, you can do a state chartered bank, which you just explained and, and which seemed the most feasible and then following the Washington model of intra. Um, I know the problem with the credit unions in, in Colorado, they had to go to the Federal Reserve in Kansas City. Uh, we would go to the Federal Reserve in San Francisco, so there was some feeling because they're in San Francisco, uh, perhaps we could get a blessing to put money in there and go through the ACH system too. So I'm sure what I'm talking about is very redundant of what you're all investigating and such and what he talked about, but I've been dying to say this. So. <laughs> California yeah, is working you. hard. Yeah, so, so thank you, you know, um, and we did look into that and met with the uh, Federal Reserve folks in San Francisco, and they're still part of the federal system, and that's the problem. I mean, even though they uh, would like to do it and they're maybe a little bit more um, liberal uh, than the others, but they're still part of, you know, they still have one boss and that's still the federal government. California is working hard. They're trying to settle this issue. I mean, there are a couple of companies that we know of that have set up intrastate systems where you know the the rails I talked to you about, where they're just from one bank to another, never goes on the federal system. You could use a swipe card, you could use kiosk and all the dispensaries to where that kiosk is only used to buy the you know the the products in that store right there, and that kiosk connected to a in, intrastate system. All of that's being looked at. There are models out there, but in the end, in the end, you have to deposit the cash somewhere. You can't get past it. Believe me, we have been involved in this. I know we have been involved in this for a year and a half already. And, and our goal of looking into it was to get the cash out of the system because that's where the danger is. And I'll be darned if it all comes. We, we can set up a system all day long that will work. But you have to, and in the end, you have to put the cash somewhere. If people come into a kiosk and put cash in that kiosk, and then they get out a card and they can use that card to buy all the stuff they want in that dispensary. Somebody has to come empty that kiosk and take it somewhere. You can't get around it. There has to be a bank willing to take cash, cannabis cash. There has to be. Hold on, here, grab that microphone right behind you. We have a, a rather large casino on our, on our borders and that's a cash business as well. How do they deal with banking? Federally approved. So it pays to have political power in this case. That, that's kind of tongue in cheek. No, well, I guess, I mean, I, I mean, gambling isn't a Schedule I control right, substance. Right, that's so, true, too. Um, and, it's and people, legal. And yeah, and people always say, oh, well, why don't we have like a, a, a state bank, like uh, the Bank of North Dakota? And I have to explain that the Bank of North Dakota was set up, you know, back in the early 1900s to, uh, to bank the farming industry and farming, agriculture is not a Schedule One drug, and that's where we're having an issue: is the classification of cannabis. It doesn't matter. The bank, if if the bank is going to do any checking, ACH stuff, any ATM system, anything like that, or if they can't get private insurance, it's federal. You can't do. You can't get around it. Well, let me let me tell you. If you could, I knew a guy in '06 who was trying to put together a can of bank. So, I mean, this would have been done a long time ago. So until the feds make those changes, banks, because think about it from a bank's, well, how about this? Think about it from a president of a bank point of view. Not only could they lose all of their assets, because remember, an asset seizure, an asset forfeiture, they can go in and take all your assets, because there was their ill-gotten gains, right? Everything is connected. They can take all the assets. You lose all, so you may have 3% as your cannabis income. You lose everything else for that 3%. Who's willing to do that? And secondly, as a bank president, you can go to prison. You personally can go to prison and your house and your cars and everything can be taken as well. And so on the board of easy. directors, right? You have a board of directors who's also responsible. Um, and if we weren't live streaming, I would say a couple other things. <laughs> um, uh, but I think, you know, the, 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 genie, the genie is out of the bottle, okay? I mean, it is just way too big an industry. You know, over half of the states have passed it. Uh, the federal government, you know, by, uh, you know, continuing to, to, to talk about that, you know, we still have a war on drugs. I mean, I don't know where they're living, but it's clearly not in the same place that most of us, um, you know, are, 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 are 
where we are today. So uh, I always say please lobby your federal legislators, especially since they have control uh, of both houses. It has to go through the banking committee in Congress. Um, you know, to the extent that they don't want to do um, things, then, you know, we have opportunities in 2018 and 2020. Uh, but right now, you know, we are pushing everybody really hard um, on our federal congressional level. And I know there's a lot of issues that we're lobbying our, our delegation, but please, like, we really need your help to, um, to let your members know, because a lot of them are out here. Uh, as well, and just let them know that this is, you know, an industry. It's it's it can create a lot of money. It it is making a lot of money. It's just not generating as much, paying their taxes and their fair share and the public safety. And, and you know, we really uh, need them to kind of push it and vote the right way. Uh, very quickly, you've heard us talk about the coal memo. Here's a couple of positions on the coal memo. Uh, again, another reason why bankers don't feel. Really, you know, like in your mother's arms with that Cole's a memo, Cole memo. The Cole memo, this is by uh, John Vardaman. He's the vice president general counsel of a company called Hyper. The deal has been trying to deal with the issue of banking, Canada banking for a long time. Cole memorandum, FinCEN guidance constitute a roadmap of how banks can permissibly service the industry. Now, if you see those FinCEN guidelines, they say, if you go by these guidelines, and by the way, they costed it out to be about $10,000 per customer, bank, your customer in my bank, you're gonna pay me about 10 grand for me to take your cannabis money because I have all of these hoops I have to jump through for the feds. I have, I think almost every, I think twice a year, it wasn't every quarter, but twice a year you have full audits and full reports to constantly give to the feds. So they outline, here are the things that would make us feel more comfortable on the KYC stuff and all the auditing issues. So they did that so people are feeling comfortable that if they, that's why there are several banks, she, as Fiona mentioned, that are taking cannabis because they're using the FinCEN guidelines, thinking that that'll at least help us in court if they do go after us. Yeah, so uh, FinCEN, it is guidelines, the Cole Memo, it's guidelines, it is not law, um, and that's um, why, you know, it's, it's it's, it's used as uh, guidelines, and banks are trying to uh, fit those guidelines. The federal government so far uh, is continuing to move forward with it, but the rule could change, right, any day. And if the rule changes, then we have a whole other situation, and we could be going down another path uh, very quickly in California. But right now, I think uh, we are hoping that, um, you know, Congress, uh, and the president, they're going to start easing banking access because that's what we really do want. Uh, we want full integration, you know, of these uh, companies, of the customers, um, of their clients and vendors and uh, patients. We want them fully integrated in the banking system. So we are, uh, this report uh, from John Chung, Treasurer John Chung, kind of is a pathway there. But like I said, if the federal government does uh, take a different uh, turn and, and prevents banks and from taking the money, you know, rescinds the Cole Memo and the FinCEN guidelines, and we're uh, clearly in a totally different situation. Uh, the last quote there you see, that's a local bank in Sacramento, and the woman president there has been very involved in this. It's, like I said, it's a state chartered bank, local, small. There's somebody who could look at this and she hit it right on the head, which probably spells out 99% of the banking leaders' uh, attitudes about this. Uh, yeah, Can it, it's not a safe harbor. So I think that's what, that's it. So any any other questions on the banking stuff? How it relates to you, very quickly, is like Fiona said, you guys are legally can take in taxes. You can take tax revenues from any kind of business you're doing because you're collecting you know, business taxes and the like, just like any other business in your area. So you put that all together and you send it off and you get your piece of it. And until the feds come in and say every city or county or special district who's collecting any tax revenue from anything dealing with cannabis uh, is in big trouble, I think you feel pretty good about continuing to collect your tax revenues. Well, keep it in mind, BOE collects them and they commingle it we made a joke. We said the CEO of, of the BOE is 
the largest <laughs> money launderer in the country. Yes, California is. <laughs> California we are. Is. We are. Okay, so. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, I didn't want to get him in trouble or anything. Yeah, so, so that's why I started out with the premise that if we are collecting these taxes, we haven't been doing it, we have been doing it for 10 years, why can't we collect more? And why can't we collect taxes for local governments, for the Franchise Tax Board, for the IRS? I mean, we want to do it, we have been doing it, um, but that also, I guess, could be an option. And it's, it's a lot. It's going to be a lot of money. It's going to be a lot of money in this state. In five years, it's, they, they were saying it was $30 billion. Thirty billion. I mean, that's a lot of money. That's a lot. Half of it goes to the schools, right? So anyway, any questions? Any questions on banking before we open it up? All right. So at this point, we just want to open it up to you guys to talk about any of the issues we talked about today. A bunch of people were grabbing us during lunch. I thought, hold on to that. Let's talk about that. That's a good question. That's a good question. Right, let's talk about that. Or we got a lot of statements from people. One thing I'd like to do real quickly, though. Can you raise your hand? Well, I tell you what. How many do we? How many cities do we have here represented? Don't know. So, how many cities in the room allow some type of cannabis business? Where are you from, and what is it? Desert Hot Springs. Desert Hot Springs. Oh yeah, I know about you guys. You do it all. You do it all. <laughs> how long have you been doing it? So you allow dispensaries. So let me ask you this, revenue, how's it been? Well, the revenue's been a little slower than what we had, in it, but it has nothing to do with the fact of the business, it's just a fact of construction phases, because we started with the dispensaries, revenues has increased every year, every time. Cultivation, we've approved probably over 50 conditional use permits. We've got about a half a dozen now that are online, another half a dozen under construction. So those are starting to come in as well. Um, I think cannabis related, we've probably collected just a little over a million dollars just singularly just that in a, in a fiscal year. Do you tax it? Mm -hmm. The uh, canopy tax is $25 a square foot for the first 3,000 square feet, $10 a square foot afterwards. That was voted in by the public. Uh, sales tax is, I believe, 10% for dispensaries. On top of your sales tax? Or it's 10% total? 10% straight. Got it, got it. Yeah. Right, right, right. And Anybody else? Any, well, I'm sorry. Were you done? Uh, I was just going to say. What about crime issues? Anything you can um, add? We have, yeah, actually, the, what we've had is incredible redevelopment that we've had. Substandard dilapidated buildings that were all rehabbed and remodeled into dispensaries. Old, uh, tired, junket warehouse kind of buildings have been converted into nice uh, 40,000 square foot, $6 million invested um, cultivation facilities. Vacant land has now got brand new buildings on it. Uh, we've had no loitering issues because the conditions that we've put on, the conditions of approval during the CUP process have, have been very uh, user friendly for the city's needs and the police department's needs. So I can only think of one criminal act that occurred and. All it was is they broke the window, they got inside of a dispensary, and they just only got into the waiting room because the conditions we placed on it required the security uh, double entry door system, but they were surrounded by videos and everything, and it was like you just got into a waiting room and that's all you got. So otherwise, it's been, it's been great for our area. Any other cities? Yes. Hold it. <laughs> go, Randy, go. <laughs> I'm with the city of Palm Springs, and we had a tax initiative on the ballot that passed Measure E, which is going to fund our law enforcement needs um, for the new cannabis business. And we are expanding to recreational as well as medical, and that's effective January 1st. Um, we have accepted 14 applications. We have a really extensive application, um, but we have had previously the six um, collectives for the city. Oh, or what, are you, what are you allowing? Um, right, as of January 1st, it's going to be everything. It's we're dispensing, cultivation, dispensing, cultivation, uh, manufacturing, it. everything. Got it. 
Can you briefly talk about the uh, merits or demerits of a flat tax versus a tax based on uh, percentage of revenue? As far as collecting, keeping track, anything like that, any experiences? We're in the process of looking potentially at a tax measure in our city, in Moreno Valley. And just wondering if there's any shared experience on that issue. Well, when you say flat tax, you're talking I about mean, just- $100,000 per dispensary per year, for example, oh, as a tax. Oh, got it, got it, I don't know anyone who does that. Yeah, but I mean, that'd be interesting. Yeah, I mean, like, um, I, I don't think there's, there's like any sort of best practices in terms of the taxes because everybody is trying to uh, figure out uh, under this new Prop 64 scheme, like how to uh, tax. Um, they obviously want it to be easier, uh, right? Um, so whatever, you know, I, I would say uh, if you can um, propose something that's easier, uh, for taxpayers as well as your government officials to assess and collect, it's going to make it much easier. Otherwise, you're going to have to hire a lot of uh, folks to go out and, and check and do the audits. Yeah, I mean, like, yeah. And so, and that's what I said. Like, we are tax collectors, but we do not want to go and uh, go to every, dis uh, every farm and count, you know, plants. So that's why we really depend on a robust track and trace system um, to give us that information so that we are going to collect at the distribution uh, level, the excise tax, uh, and then as well as you know the the sales tax uh, at the dispensary level. So, um, yeah, it's I don't know how people are going to keep track of it, but I presume you know with a good track and trace system that they're going to be able to to do that. I guess you could say you know fifty thousand dollars a year for dispensary. We're going to have four dispensaries, so we know we have two hundred grand coming in every year. I mean. For a large dispensary who's pumping out a lot of product, that's going to be cheap, right? For a small one who maybe isn't doing as good business, that's going to be a huge hit to them and maybe makes them fail. So it's kind of difficult. It's like any business, you know. It's kind of difficult in this industry how you tax them equally if they're not if they're different sizes and and the like. Some may be have the license which is vertically vertically integrated where they're growing their own. Therefore, their product is very inexpensive um, versus one that's just buying everything from someone else. Therefore, their, their margin's a lot smaller. That 50 or 100 could put them out of business. So I don't know. Question is, uh, City of Baldwin Park has, has just instituted with, through the development agreements and they have $10 a square foot annually every year. So if you've got, you know, 20,000 square foot well, times 10, that's what you have. And it's a 15 year development agreement, five years re reviewed every five years. So you can calculate exactly what you've got. Um, the legality of that is it's legal, you can do that. Um, you know, at some point you're gonna wanna have a, a ballot measure where you have a tax that's on there. But that's how a lot of these cities have been begun integrating this because they don't, you know, they're not doing a special election or they gotta wait till November of next year for taxes and so they're doing it through the development agreement so like what he's talking about is in essence it's not really a flat tax but it's a fee that you charge ten dollars a square foot or whatever agreeable amount and that's just what you do blanket whether it's cultivation manufacturing etc you come up with that agreed upon amount and it's just you know a suggestion that is operating right now in some of our cities in LA County So that, that's actually going to be in addition to. Development fees are entirely different. Those are just one-time fees for construction and everything. A development agreement fee would be an annual fee that you'd, you'd pay, kind of like the canopy tax fee that we have in Desert Hot Springs. Hmm. What other, what are, any other cities doing anything in the room on cannabis? So, so this might be along the same lines of what was just asked, but <clears throat> in a city like Desert Hot Springs where you talked about having some maybe blighted areas or areas where we're kind of needing uh, some attention, have they been willing to put in the development impact fees to bring the utilities out there like electricity, water, recycled water, and then roads and drainage and other types of, of things that are going to be needed to, to develop an area? So is that, is that a separate fee? that you guys are, are considering, or is that 
a fee that you can add to the cannabis business just the way that you might have to pay for additional law enforcement or code enforcement and then you say well we also need some utilities and, and that's right but what, what is eligible for well, I know fees? in some well I know in some cities they have said to the cannabis industry or businesses who want to build say you need to give us X amount of dollars for a substation for your power we, we can't get that much power out to where they're, and they're making them pay it. Yeah. And, Another and fire station and these sorts of things or police station or substation for the police department if, if you think it's going to generate I, that kind I of I assume need. you would treat it the same as any other developer. I mean, yeah, as if there's a nexus, you can make them, you can charge them to do it. I mean, I think you could. I mean, we haven't really heard of that. But yeah, I agree in San Francisco, like these manufacturing companies are using a lot of power 24-7, right? And so they're requiring them to put in extra power and pay for it uh, because they keep blowing the grid. Uh, and that's a problem, right? So that is an issue as well as water. And I know some of the uh, cities or the counties, you know, that they want to do cannabis, but they don't have a, the, the, the right water infrastructure. So, you know, even if you get a permit, you still can't grow, right? Hmm. All right. Anything else? Any, well, I just, any other cities doing anything on cannabis? So the rest have put moratoriums, bans, whatever your city calls them, until you guys do more research or until you, or you've already made your decision. Um, all right. Well, our goal today was to try and hit all the, all the sides of this thing. What is happening, what isn't, what can, what can't. Um, we're available, all of, our, all of us have emails and phone numbers and you know, websites. Um, we're available to talk about any, like I said, I deal with a lot of public safety issues. Jonathan represents the chiefs. Uh, obviously, Mike does all, you know, city stuff. That's his entire part of his portfolio. Amir is the expert on all the, all the licensing at the state level, but also how the, he's the industry expert. He knows good players, bad players, the like. Thank you. Hmm? Me, thank you. What? Thank you. Yeah, well, I haven't gotten to you yet. And then Fiona, of course, is the banking expert and Call our me. resident CPA. Yes. I just wanted to make one comment because I think I'm not sure for the first city that this has occurred in or not, but we're all talking about local control, and we were very pleased to see the local control um, written into Prop 64. But then there's that other thing called the initiative process. And so we have already had a group that has come into our town and they have qualified through signatures for an initiative written the way they want it. And now it will be on the ballot in June. It's already been set for election. So the council has consequently, we're putting our own opposite initiative on. So our residents will have a choice. Um, but that I guess in a way that is local control because it is the people that have sure. in that area that have signed for it, but it certainly pulls it out of the council's hands to a point. And the initiative process itself, in my opinion, is very flawed because signature gatherers can say literally anything they want to try to get that signature. And so you have things that go to ballot that people think it's for one thing and it's for something else. So there's a whole lot of moving parts, but that's just to say conceivably in Haruba Valley, if that were to pass next June, which I am hoping it does not, um, we have lost our council local control. Mm -hmm. And it's been taken by a group of what I'm gonna call entrepreneurs that have come in because they see the money and they see the business potential and those kinds of things. But I mean, things. keep in mind, your constituents still have to pass it. They do, yeah. you're absolutely right. So if right. the people pass it, then the people have spoken and regardless. Let me give you an example of a city. You brought up, you reminded me of something. There was a city, I won't say who it is, and a group came in from the outside, came in from the outside and did exactly what you're saying. They were adamantly opposed to anything cannabis. Well, these guys came in and were allowing for dispensaries and I think cultivation. Cultivation too? Anyway, they uh, put it on the ballot with no, re no tax, nothing. So no revenue to the city. <laughs> city immediately freaks out, holds an emergency meeting and 
develops their own measure to put on the map. We know about it because we drafted the city's measure for them. Countermeasure, right? They said, well, and then another one, another measure came on. So there were already two that qualified now for, that one was for growing. The city came in and said, okay, we're gonna come in and we're just putting on a straight tax on anything cannabis. Well, the other two measures passed and the cities did not because they got in so late. They had already been doing all the advertising and campaigning on their two initiatives, city laws. So now they voted, they have can't, both dispensaries and cultivation, they're saying they have no revenue on it. They get no revenue on it. Yeah. In exactly those instances, is if you're a council and you think that uh, you, you want to ban it, and if you think that somebody is not going to come from outside of your city more often than not and put a measure on the ballot, uh, you're, you're mistaken. It's going to happen. Now, the problem is what councils do is they don't do the research. They don't do the, out, the outreach to their citizens. So the same five people in the city manager that want to ban it come up with trying to build a better mousetrap, and it's very rarely unsuccessful. And so what's happening is these initiatives are forcing the city council's hand. And instead of do, using professionals to help them build a better mousetrap, they're just, the people who, want, who don't want it to happen are building a contraption that usually does not work. And so you end up with this outside initiative, oftentimes, not all the time, but, but usually that's what happens. So if that is happening to you, I would strongly urge you to work with a professional to help guide you in most instances, you're going to get advice that you may not be entirely happy with because when you survey your residents, you get what their opinion is, and it may not be the, the opinion that the council wants, but that's what the opinion is. And that's when you see measures successfully implemented that while are not banned, are actually good public policy that the local jurisdiction can live with. Including instances, as I mentioned earlier, like the city, and I'll say the city, it's Riverside, whose constituency did not want anything. Normally what we do is we try to put something that's a little bit better and then we put this, what we call a poison pill, which is whichever vote gets the highest negates the other. We get you know, creative that way. But there are absolutely jurisdictions and there are communities that do not want anything. They want a ban, they want a complete ban. But you would be surprised when you go out and actually ask your residents and quantify their, their responses on what you're going to find from the community. And if you don't, you're going to end up with, again, I'm not just saying your city, I'm saying any city in the next three to five years, you will have a citizen or a industry-backed measure coming to a city near you. It's going to happen. That's what they're doing. There are, there are companies who are going around and being hired by local growers and dispensaries to go into their city and, put a, and qualify a measure. Yes, the city of Hemet is facing that same situation, yeah. Laura. Yes, uh, so we're being forced into that at this point. Uh, but my question is, the, 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 is it the same group of people that are going everywhere? Because this is very exclusive to this one organization being the only ones then that will ever be allowed to have grows or dispensaries within the city limits. So I mean, it's extremely self-serving for a what I'm thinking is a very small group, but it's probably a very large group in the cannabis industry. So I, I need this gentleman's business card too so that we can talk. Let me, let me explain what's happening out there. The short answer is no, it's not one group. But, but what it, the short answer is no, it's not one group, but what is happening all over the state is people, usually individuals that are already selling in your community, are financing measures that either grandfather them in or set up land use decisions that force their hand on properties they already own to protect their own monopoly in that community. The good news about that is that's usually the weakness that allows us to beat those measures back. But as I mentioned, the, the, the bad news, depending on what your perspective is, is it usually forces a discussion in a community where some sort of permitting is desired by the residents even though the council may not want it. And that's why I was saying earlier, the earlier you begin this discussion with your community, the better you're going to develop public policy. Because any city that has banned, eventually some interest group, some entrepreneurs are going to keep coming back every year until something happens. And they're nine times out of ten going to be written to benefit them. 
as opposed to what your city can live with. Also, we are seeing some cities up in Northern California, up above the Bay Area, where the cities are really just, they're developing subcommittees just to look at cannabis. And they're there, that's, uh, and you, you raised a very good point. What they're asking their subcommittees to do is go out and meet with the public, meet with vendors, people who may already be doing growing or dispensing. Um, and that they've, they've assigned that to a subcommittee of their, of their council. And they're looking into all the cannabis issues and coming to these seminars, stuff like that. So that is happening. I know of about four cities in Northern California that have done that already in the last, just in the last six months. So in, in San Francisco, um, we've pretty much uh, had a Wild West mentality and, and you know a lot of uh, folks are doing all sorts of business in San Francisco that the city council just oh, yeah. uh, put a moratorium on any new licenses uh, until we see what is going to happen after January 1st. So cities sometimes are going the other way now and saying, hey, we've got a pretty robust system already. You know, we should probably figure out where we want to go um, in this next, you know, five, ten years. So let's like hold off. So nobody's getting any new licenses in, in San Francisco. You can't stop it with your. What's the difference between putting a moratorium on it for a little while or banning it completely like us? If they want to put an initiative in, couldn't they do that and override San Francisco too? Yeah, but I, I think moratorium versus a ban sounds different, right? Moratorium means, hey, we're just going to take a little time out, figure this out, you know, maybe form some committees, but we're, we're not going to completely shut it down. Whereas a ban to people is like, never, not now, forget it. And the other issue, yeah, is that they have already allowed, like she said, they have a robust system already going. So you're not going to get all those people who already are licensed and doing business to support any initiative, you know, to force more competition to be able to get their licenses. They're just saying, this, this happened like two weeks ago, they're just saying we're putting the brakes on, on new licensees for a little bit until after January so we can see what the regulations are. So I think, for the most part, people are okay with that. Unless you were next in the queue. Right. <laughs> right. All right, well, thank you guys. I appreciate yeah, it. Please you. call us, and, and we'll come and talk to your people. <laughs>